off with the school board and the town council at which we hear the presentation of the school board budget. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> I'm Jessica Sullivan, a, a town councilor, and I'm this year's finance chair. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, if everyone would go around the room, uh, starting with the school board, with Ms. Carr, and introduce yourselves for folks in the audience and people at home. I'm the school board. My name is John Voltz, and I'm a school board member. I'm Barbara Powers, school board. Susanna Mazel, Hub School Board Vice Chair. Catherine Messmer, Business Manager, School Park and Town Controller. Joe Marcy, School Board. Elizabeth Seifrey, School Board Chair. Howard Coulter, Superintendent. Matt Sturgis, Town Manager. Jessica Sullivan, Town Council. Kathy Ray, Town Council. Jamie Garvin, Town Council. Caitlin Jordan, Town Council. Patty Grennan, Town Council. Sarah Lennon, Town Council. Penny Jordan, Town Council. Thank you. And as, as the, t the school board, some of the school board members just discovered, they have a wireless mic. Because we were arranging the room earlier today, and some of the cords that connect our microphones are very short, and we had a little difficulty. So thank you very much for using the uh, wireless mic. And some of us are going to have to share. Um, but I appreciate very much everyone's uh, willingness to televise our meeting, and I hope we can do this on an annual basis um, going forward. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank our uh, Code Enforcement Officer, Ben McDougall, because the Zoning Board of Appeals is, would have been in here tonight, and those meetings are normally televised. So they are in the Jordan Conference Room, not televised. This is a unique situation. Hopefully, if we go forward with this regularly, we can coordinate. But I want to thank Ben uh, and the Zoning Board very much. Um, I also want to thank uh, Matt Sturgis, the town manager, Catherine Mesmer, our business manager, and also Arlene Rochefort for uh, working very hard to help put together a lot of the information that we have tonight. And, um, but I, will, I, will, uh, excuse me, I want to proceed on with the school board. I want to thank the school board members for all that they have done. Um, it, is so, uh, it is such a pleasure to see the new budget format that Catherine initiated last year. So this year we're looking at apples and apples. And so that has been a real pleasure and we all appreciate that very much, I'm sure. And so, you know, we've all done our homework and studied our stuff and so I think it's time to proceed. Um, at this uh, time I'd like to offer the public any comment. If, there, if anyone from the public would like to speak now on uh, a, any issue on our workshop tonight, you have this opportunity. Oh. No okay, thank you. So we'll proceed at this uh, time. I'd like to invite Elizabeth Seifries, who's a school board chair, to come to our podium and <coughs> give us her presentation. I'd like to thank all town councilors for your service to our community and welcome our new town manager. We haven't had a chance to meet personally, but I hope we do soon. Um, I'd also like to start this conversation by thanking the members of the town council for attending one or more of our budget workshops. It is clear that you are dedicated to be well educated about our budget process and details. We thank you for this time and effort. We have great things going on in our schools. This town has a lot to be proud of with respect to our schools. We have a wealth of diversity of accomplishments. 
Number one, we have a less than 1% dropout rate. And I need to let that sit with everybody for a minute. The state average is 13.6%. We are less than 1%. That's pretty amazing. At the same time, our students have been achieving at a very high level in endeavors such as music, speech and debate, mock trial, who are state champions for the seventh year in a row. We have a middle school chess club recently founded that became state champions. Our robotics teams are state champions, Science Bowl state champions, Model UN successes, and I can't even go into the athletic successes around new, you know, team and individual <coughs> champions this year and last. The list goes on and on. There's a lot happening here to be celebrated, and there are many areas in which we can improve. Because we are obligated by law to educate all students who reside in this town, meeting their physical, social, emotional, and academic needs. Enrollment is not strictly about the numbers, but about the needs of each student. Educating students become, has become increasingly more complex with every year that passes. We have students that need support and accommodations in a variety of levels throughout our system. We have special ed students with various diagnoses. We have students on individualized health plans, students who are on a 504 plan. And to hear more about what those are, I may call on Jessica Clark to kind of explain what those legal obligations are. We have students who are struggling to learn and need individualized help. We have students who are gifted and talented and need enrichment and specialized instruction in order to be challenged. We do all this while our cost per child, what we spend per pupil, is second to lowest in our area. You can see that graph in the handouts tab on page 43 if you're interested. Remember as you look at that graph, our spending, our staffing, and our decisions are always driven by student need. And I'm not doing a PowerPoint tonight because again, I'm, I'm thankful to Catherine Mesper and her staff for putting together this great binder, so I will be referring to pages and tabs in this binder. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the process, and I too am thankful to Catherine Mesmer, but also to Kathy Stankard and Joe Morrissey and also Barbara Powers for bringing forward um, a new process for us to use this year in, in a way that we could look at the entire budget, even though it was a long, it was a grueling night, but we were able to hear from all departments and, and see things globally. But that was not even the beginning. That was sort of... That was toward the end. Administrators and department had started budget work in October. Our superintendent asked each of them to start from ground zero with a clean slate. The absolute opposite of just rolling over whatever was spent last year and adding a little on. And carefully determine what was needed for staffing and programs based entirely on what kids need. In this process of needs-based budgeting, looking at each school or department with fresh eyes, programs and staffing, whether new or long-standing, were evaluated for effectiveness and appropriateness. The approach led to changes, additions, and cuts. I'm going to move to the new program and position evaluations tab. We have a new process for evaluating new initiatives, a systematic way of reviewing recently added positions or programs to see if they are working, and if so, how well. Is this the most eff effective and efficient way we can deliver this program or service? This year, in some cases, some were eliminated as a result of this, this process. I'm going to let you later on just, just tab through that, but I'm going to move to the new program and position proposal tab. 
There is also a new process for proposed positions and programs, a way to explain and justify a need for a new position or program. <coughs> Many of these proposals, while worthy, did not make the cut this year. Our administrators and department heads also did deep analysis of expenditures, budgets that were overspent, underspent, and why. All along, at every step, our superintendent and our administrators were very sensitive to the fact that any increase has an impact. Based on all of this, with student need at the heart of it all, the budget was built. Before the school board could see it, the state shared its preliminary subsidy numbers and we were down $800,000 for the second time in two years. As an exercise, the board directed the superintendent to first absorb that cut. Then, together, we painstakingly and with great scrutiny built back in the greatest needs for our students. Now I'm going to talk about budget drivers. First off, we'll talk about the revenue side. At the top has to be state subsidy. This is determined by the EPS formula, which is essential programs and services, and two factors that are enrollment and property valuation. Many other factors, some not entirely clear to us or the public, and some change year to year. Our state subsidy has a history of varying wildly. We are on the receiving end of a $1.6 million cut over the past two years, and it is still unknown what our final revenue number will be this year. It may not be clear until June. The next part on the revenue side, we have the unassigned fund balance. This can be used only once a year during budget as a revenue source. And it is used every year for the past several years to lower the tax impact. You can see the history of our use of the unassigned fund balance on page 45 in the handouts tab. <clears throat> Next revenue source, we have grants. We have federal, state, and community-based grants that we work very hard to spend down. We also have a very small trickle of fees, including athletic and parking fees. And in the end, we have local property taxes. But I want to speak a moment about what parents pay on top of their property taxes for their children's school expenses. There is an athletic fee at the high school and the middle school for students who want to play sports. However, all parents, whether their students play sports or do whatever, are given a list just about every year of supplies to buy at the beginning, sometimes asked again halfway through and at the end. And that expenditure can range from $70 to several hundred. It includes things like pens, pencils, scissors, markers, colored pencils, crayons, binders, paper, notebooks, calculators, some of them very expensive, compasses, protractors, musical instruments, and also boxes of tissues, Ziploc bags, paper towels, disinfecting wipes, all sorts of things that parents didn't used to have to buy. And now we get to the spending side of the budget. First, I'll talk really briefly about facilities. We continue to take direction from our 10-year capital improvement plan, but we are reevaluating those needs, what did and did not make it onto that list, and what issues have cropped up since that plan's creation five or six years ago. <coughs> A new facility study is in order. The maintenance, upkeep, and cleanliness of our buildings remains a priority. Now I'm going to talk about staffing. <clears throat> we are currently in negotiations with the teachers union known as the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. The school board is using the services of a professional negotiator, as are the teachers, and negotiations are going very well. 
We are pleased that our insurance increase rates came in so low. And that's a direct reflection of how hard our staff work at staying healthy and fit. We had cautiously budgeted a 6% increase. And that number came in at 1.8%. 1, 1 a, a piece of perspective is that the highest districts in the state, at the highest level, was just below 10%. The board directed those cost savings between our 6% budgeted and 1.8% actual directly to tax relief. While there have been some critical additions to staffing in this budget, some of them are budget neutral due to shifting exist existing staff into new or different roles. And I need to just remind again that it, Staffing is not just about the number of staff, but where they fall in the lane, which is the amount of education, also and combined with years of teaching. I have a handout that can come around. I think Catherine has that handout showing people where our staff fall in each lane, which means the amount of education, and at what level of service they fall. And I'll pause while that comes around. So as you look at that handout, you can see that there are years of experience from 0 to 57, and then the lanes are a bachelor's degree, BA plus 30, <coughs> doctorate, master's, and master's plus 30, and where, whichever lane a teacher falls in combined with the years of experience determine their pay rate. Our staffing in Cape Elizabeth is driven entirely by student need. It is not simply about the number of students, but the complexity of their needs. We continue to see an upward trend in our budget in costs for special needs, specifically special services to include special education, 504, gifted and talented, struggling students, and English as a second language, which is usually <coughs> described as ELL. A new cost, relatively new within the last several years, is retirement. What has traditionally been a state cost has recently been shifted to local municipalities. Normal teacher retirement, as what it was called, was funded 100% by the state for the past 70 years. Governor LePage began shifting those costs to school districts in the 200, uh, 2013 biennium budget. As of the 2017-2018 budget year, schools will have a 58% increase in retirement costs. It seems like his goal is to shift it to 100%. However, at this time, there is a bill in the legislature trying to shift some of that back. Whoever knows where that's going to go. Now we're moving on to enrollment. If you would move to page one in the enrollment and staffing tab. We continue to see a very gradual decline in enrollment. We hired the professional firm Planning Decisions in 2015 to do a 10 year enrollment projection. What we have noted from this study and others done in the past is that the projections are always off. As we have had more students enrolled every year than have been predicted. There is also the unpredictability of students withdrawing and enrolling mid-year. If you would turn to page five of enrollment and staffing, and I believe it's a double-sided, so you may miss it. You can see that our middle school has kept track of this kind of unpredictable mid-year enrollment showing in parentheses the students that withdrew and regular numbers as students that have arrived. 
And as of February 2017, we have a net gain of 12 students that were completely unpredicted at the middle school. And again, enrollment is not just about the numbers, but about the need of those students. So now we kind of pull back and just take a look at the big picture. The final page, page 52 in the handouts tab. It's kind of where the rubber hits the road. As you can see, our typical spending increase over the past five years is around 3%. This year, it is 2.4%. We are delivering a high quality educational experience for all students while spending less than we have in many years past and less than many of our neighboring school departments. The deep cut in our state subsidy is the story here. We have historically had dramatic swings in subsidy and this year's projected $800,000 cut comes after a $780,000 cut last year. We have a chart and a table that also kind of graphically shows the changes in school budget and enrollment versus changes in state educational funding that I believe Catherine can send around. So as we take a look, you can see the biggest variable in our budgeting experience. It is wildly unpredictable and it is not sustainable to take these sorts of cuts year after year and continue to provide the high quality education that this town expects. This is a budget that meets the needs of our students and the mandate of our town. A final handout for you. We have some major additions to our budget this year and major reductions that you may just look at at your leisure. At this time, if you would like to um, hear from anybody, I used, um, I referred to 504 a couple of times and special ed and things like that. If you would like um, Jessica Clark to come up and explain what that means or anything like that before questions, I'm sure that she's happy to do that. Or if you would want to wait and build that in another time, that's fine. Sure. Well, I, I'm thinking that it might be wise to wait until the council's ready for questions. Sure. And then, then can ask through you. Great. For any of, I just hate any to of, leave things dangling out there, any acronyms or numbers that just don't make sense, so that's why I offered. Yeah. If so. the council okay with that? Actually, I'm an upfront data collector, so I'm sorry. That's quite if all right. If I understand it, it would be great. No, absolutely, no problem. And would, would the council mind if I sat while we turn it over to questions? Is that okay? Oh, sure. Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm Jessica Clark, the Director of Special Services. It's nice to meet you all. Um, there are different tiers of services that we provide, um, and they fall under the specialty of the Special Services Department. Uh, we have the 504, and we have an individualized education plan, and both do fall under this department, and both uh, do provide services. It's just a matter of the level of services. 
So how I picture it is a 504 gives a child that has a specific diagnosis, and we do have criteria by the state that we need to follow in order to make that um, eligibility determination. Um, the 504 allows the student to access the environment where they are, where education is delivered or their curriculum is delivered. So these typically are the students that have health issues um, that require a little bit more support. It might be some type of um, environmental manipulation that we have to do. The child might have to sit in the front of the classroom or might have to have frequent breaks. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily involve anything different with the delivery of instruction. Um, once a child uh, is seen to have um, a difficult time accessing the education in the classroom, and this is a result of a disability that is um, something that's categorized by the state as an eligible disability, such as autism, speech and language um, disorder, um, intellectual developmental disabilities, uh, there's quite a few. Um, that is at the point that um, a team would get together and determine that this child isn't able to access the education that's being delivered in a, um, the regular education classroom, and they need significant modifications to the curriculum in order to reach wherever their level of um, proficiency is. So those students um, usually require the instruction of a specialist, and we have multiple specialists in our school department, as I'm sure you're aware. We have special education teachers, occupational therapists, school psychologists, speech and language pathologists, behavior specialists, um, and those, um, as well as educational technicians. So those, those people help those individuals access education at whatever their level is. Um, it could be in the classroom, it could be out of the classroom. In addition to those two, we also have individualized health plans. Um, those typically come before a 504, and those are usually something that's done with the school nurse and the classroom teacher. So that would be if the student um, has to have frequent snacks because of a blood sugar issue, um, if they have a cast on their leg, and it's a temporary issue. Um, those are something that's a plan that's written. Um, once you get to the 504, there are legal obligations and implications if it's not followed. And once you get to the IEP, um, there are even more stringent um, regulations that we must follow. That was a really quick overview of the difference. Um, I could talk all night, but if you have any questions about those three, I'm more than happy to answer them. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? Oh. Penny, did you have a question? Or? Oh, I'm all set, thank you. Okay. Um, before we continue, um, I wanted to uh, read something on I, after we convened the meeting, and I've neglected to do that, but I'd like to take this moment to go ahead, um, because there have been question about this, questions about this, uh, this t the meeting that we're having annually in the past, and for those at home especially. Um, <clears throat> The town charter authorizes the town council to adopt an annual budget, and the council shall, quote, approve the budget with or without amendments. The budget authority, the council has the budget authority to, to determine the number, um, you know, the amount of the school budget that goes to the voters. The town council is legally required to review the school budget, and although the town council does not determine how to allocate the school budget, again, it must review the entire budget. Um, and this is deemed by our town charter and also Maine state law requires the council to approve the school budget amount that goes to the voters. So I just wanted to say that for folks who wonder why, why we're doing this. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. All right. So to move on, um, Elizabeth, you're ready to entertain questions of the school board and, and teachers that are here. Um, so at this time, let's let's proceed with questions that any counselors have um, with the budget binder they have in front of them, or and also with part of the presentation. Is anyone ready to to jump in? Yeah, okay. Patty, Councilor Grannon. Sure, I'll, I'll ask a question to follow up, um, just because we got just educated on some of the um, things in special ed. Um, one of the things, as I was going through this, uh, my question was. Um, looking at the overview of how many students are in special ed and the annual cost with it. And, um, and these are just, I, I'm curious um, with some of this. It, it said, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of these numbers, it was 160 uh, students total for about a $2.5 million, a $2,441,896 budget. 
um, then they, it was around $15,000 per student in cost. Um, so I was curious, how does this compare to similar districts in Maine as far as the number of students and the spending um, as far as the cost per student? I'm just curious. And um, as well, how much is this, are we increasing in special ed students per year? Do you have any of that information? Who, who would like to answer that? Or Rephrase this question: How many special ed students do we have compared to other districts, as well as what do we? Yeah, so it's three part. On average, per student. Um, so the. Other districts? Um, yeah, so be compared to other students, other districts, um, and maybe it's Yarmouth the most compatible, comparable. I'm not really sure. Whatever you think, but um, so compared to our, where do we sit as far as number of students, spending, and cost per student? So are we? Are we higher? Are we lower? Are we? Is it all similar? Um, and then, as well, um, how much are we? Are we a, kind of a magnet for? Pe are people moving here because we have such good services, or is or do we need to do better? Those kind of things. So, um, are we? How are we increasing, or are we not? Defer to our I can answer oh, a couple are. of those yeah. questions oh, for you. you. Our percentage right now of special ed is 10%, which is a relatively low number. The state average, I think, is around 17% or so. Um, it's really hard to put a comparison because we do services on an individual basis. So, it, you know, we have a kid with autism, and that kid is going to present so much differently than a kid with autism from another district looks. Um, so I think it's important for us to look at the whole um, average per cost per pupil as compared to other districts, because that gives us a, a good look on average. Um, I'm not going to remember all of your questions. <laughs> um, the, what was the last one you addressed? One of them was like, how do we cost, uh, um, as far as cost per student? Um, it's about 15000 per student. Did you answer that already? Are we, on, are we similar to other districts? I get for special ed, it's not an apples and apples comparison. So I, just the numbers that were presented, I think, as a students as a whole, I think is a better representation. Okay. Um, we do have, in the last couple weeks, I've had five phone calls from parents out of state asking about our special ed services. So people are moving here, um, and they they really want to know what we do provide, um, what credentials our specialists have. So we we employ a very high caliber of professionals and that's what these people are looking for. Um, so I think that the the districts that we tend to compare ourselves to have um, relative professionals. Everyone kind of said that upper tier. Um, so I think we're on par with where we should be as far as the special ed population. Um, although our enrollment is kind of staying steady um, and I've addressed that in some reallocation of funds with two of our special ed teaching positions. Um, I do feel that the students that are coming in, and especially um, certain grade levels, we just, the, the needs are just exponential compared to um, looking at previous data where we were. The numbers of students that have multiple disabilities seems to be expanding. So you can qualify for one disability, but um, you have to be able to target everything in the child's profile, so it requires a lot of services. So I think comparatively we're on par. Fortunately, we do have a lower number, which allows us to have our students more frequently in the classroom because we don't have that big number. Um, so I think we actually offer students um, more, even though we have you know um, less <coughs> across, as if we were to compare to other school districts. Okay. Does that answer your questions? Council Lennon? Okay. How many students do we have that um, we're financially responsible for but aren't actually in our district um, for, for, mm -hmm. for special education and also just for kids choosing to go to charter schools and so forth? I mean, does anyone know back of the envelope? Because I know that's part of our budget by law. Yep. Um, if you're asking about out of district students, technically those are still our students. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we have two students that are out of district. Um, one, we were trying to keep in district and it was costing us more than it would be to send the student out of district and actually um, in trying to save, save some cost, um, bringing in the behavior specialist, which I've asked um, for this year's budget, actually will allow us to bring that student back and have a cost savings between the salary of the behavior specialist and then the student that's out of district. Um, and then the other student that is out of district will be aging out soon. Um, but again, we could have students that move in with significant needs and we can't anticipate those costs. So um, we have a very low number of out of district kids compared to other school districts. Yes. 
May I go back to this question? Of course. Yeah. Um, oh, I wouldn't mind helping answer both those questions, both your questions, if you don't mind. Yep. Should I speak from here or up there? Well, we, well, well, we can't right, hear you back there. Right now, right I would suggest that. Because it seems that Jessica ought to stay at the podium for the, right. the time being. <laughs> um, Pull up the chair. When, when, when special education became a law, uh, that might have been 1972, so somewhere around there. The, the, there were two things that I remember. One was that it was going to be fully funded by the, by, by the federal government, and that's never happened, not one year, not, not even close. The, the thinking at the time was that this new program would be serving around 10% of, of children. That, that's the amount of children that would probably qualify for, <coughs> as having learning disabilities. And as Jessica said, that number um, is, is nearly double in terms of percent of students enrolled in some kind of a program or another. In part because um, there are, have been many other areas that qualify as disabilities now than originally were on the list. So the list was a very short list, and they just have just found more and more um, justified disabilities that now qualify. So it's a, it's a um, our, our being at 10% is, is actually quite impressive to, 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 to still be at that, that, that rate. Um, I think that every community I've ever worked for has a concern that somehow the word is out nationally, if not internationally, that if you want your kid to get a good service in special ed, be sure to come to our district. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I mean, I think that we have a very good special education program, and I think that people who have children with disabilities are, are overall impressed and pleased with the services their children provide, uh, receive. But I don't believe people that, uh, that, that there's some kind of a chart out there that is being passed around that says, here's where you want to go. It's Cape Elizabeth for special ed. Uh, there are really good programs all around. So uh, I think that's not true, it's my, it's my impression. Mm -hmm. One of the things is that we have a responsibility to provide the least restrictive environment for children. That's part of, of the law. And it's actually a very good thing. And, and it, 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 what it boils down to is that we want children, all children, to feel part of the family. And we want them to be, all of them to feel included and none excluded. And so we do our best to have the children commingle, just like at a home. And that can be quite expensive. The alternative, is, which is to place them out of district, is even more expensive and even more troubling than, for, for me than that. It takes the children often away from their families, which is just, to me, um, very sad. And, un, un, unless it's, we all agree it's the right thing to do, then it's not so sad, or is sad. Um, but I, I, I think it's true that if you look at the cost increase of regular ed, that it's a much steeper climb for that's part of a, of a school budget that's in, in, in special ed. Special ed cl is climbing at a much, uh, is increasing as, as a share of, of, of a line item in a school budget than regular ed. And, and that's because we have, as Jessica said, more and more children coming to our schools with really complicated problems, health problems, physical problems, and, um, it, it requires a lot of expertise and specialization to meet those needs. And so here we are. And um, on one hand, it's a legal requirement. I think we all agree, more importantly, it's just what we should be doing. And um, so I think the, the answer is yes. It's, it, 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 it's, it's, if school budgets are going up X percent, special education budgets are going up X percent plus something. Mm -hmm. Regarding your other question, um, what was it, ma'am? I was just saying in addition to... Oh, oh, I know what it is. All kids. Can't kids go to a charter school? And, and the, yes, they yeah. can. And, and as you said, you're right. If, if a child 
enrolls into a, a state-approved charter school, we, we are required to pay the state rate for that. Yes, you're right. How many kids? And, I, I, I mean, like let's see. Catherine, do you know what number of children like we have here, like enrolled in charter schools? I usually see a letter from them saying that these are the children by name that attend your, that are, reside in your district and <coughs> attend our schools and please pay us. I haven't seen any this year. Okay. That doesn't mean that there aren't some, but we don't, there's not, as far as I'm aware, a, a large number okay. of charter schools. We have some number that go to private schools, but but then we don't pay for that, right? No. That's right. We can work on getting that number for you. I was just curious. I was just back of the envelope. Are, are we talking 25 or two? You know, I was just yep. interested in all the kids who aren't in our school but on our payroll. Doesn't sound like many. Yep. It's a wash. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question, mm -hmm. Jessica. So, are all the special ed students under a 504 umbrella, so to speak? Are all special ed students 504 students? No. No. no? Uh, special education is an IEP. Um, 504s are considered under regular education, but because there's a process that follows in line with the IEP process, it's under this department. Um, but right now, the 504s are housed within the building um, by a building administrator. Okay. And, and is that number decreasing, the number of 504 students we have? It's increasing. And I thought in the, one of the workshops that the high school principal had a decrease in his number of 504 oh, students. Am I, am I incorrect? Increase? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Heard that incorrectly. Any other questions for Jessica Clark in a moment? Oh, not for Councilor Jordan, no? Councilor Go Jordan? ahead, Kathy. Councilor Ray? Uh, just a, a quick, um, I don't know if it's a question or of a statement. According to the book, uh, this year you have 160 special ed enrollment students and next year you have 153. So it is going down, is that correct? Actually, when those numbers were given, um, when we did the budget, that was the numbers we've had, we've qualified six since then and we have probably about eight or nine in referral. So the number will probably go up. Um, but that was the number that we had at the time. And I can give you those numbers, you know, more recent, I can send you the more recent numbers of where we are. And do you know, um, I think Howard was talking about the, um, the state paying um, directly for charter school students. So that's a wash, is that correct? Right. If we don't see the money at all, that's a wash. Do you know how much the state is paying for a charter school student? Well, it's not a wash, as far as I can tell. I mean, we pay, um, I believe that, this, that what we, we receive in state subsidies is not equal to what we're charged by the charter schools. I think it's a greater number. It's a greater fee than what we receive. So we pay. I misunderstood then because Kathy said you, you don't even see it. It goes right through. So say you had a charter school student. And if the money doesn't come into Cape Elizabeth and doesn't go out of Cape Elizabeth, but the state pays directly, what is the cost to Cape Elizabeth? Well, the cost of it actually affects their subsidy. Right. So they like that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Affects your the affects the revenue, not the expense. Yes. Right. We get more. So they like sort of bill us for it by not they, giving they us that. They take it out of our pay. They'll take it out of our pay. Right. So you're talking about giving the, you $100, they right. give you 90 Exactly. You're talking about essential programs and services? Yes. I understand they used to bill it. They did. They, they, they revised that two years ago, yeah. the legislature, because so many schools, uh, for instance, where uh, where I live up in Gray, we used to get hammered. It cost us close to close to four hundred thousand dollars two years ago out of the budget. That uh, you know, it took a legislative miracle to get the to get them to actually retail it's, that. It's very costly because you were getting billed the, the amount that the charter school chose to charge, not the amount right. of your right. individual pupil subsidy. There's a big difference. It, it was significant. And yeah. it was enough that it, uh, 
especially in the timing of it, that it impacted districts across the state to, uh, you know, the timing that it affected them was at long as their budgets were passed. So it, it was, a, you know, an August surprise, basically. So we should probably get that information. If it affects us, we should probably, if there's a way to get it, we should know. Yep. I mean, if it's two students, that's one thing. If it's 20, that's another thing. Yep. Thank you for that. Okay, any, any more questions for, for uh, Jessica Clark? Okay, thank you. So, for the council going forward, would you, how would you like to proceed? By section of the book, of the budget binder, or um, huh? with, with any questions? Shall, shall I start with each section and ask if anyone has questions on that section? How about that? Okay. Well, the first section is, uh, handouts and the actual uh, budget master report <clears throat> so are there any any questions about numbers in the budget master or any of the other documents in uh, budget highlights I have a question. I, I think it fits within this section. Uh, I was one of those odd people and I started reading it from the back forward because the summary was up here. Um, so basically as I look at uh, Pong Cove Elementary School and I believe very strongly that the foundation is what is key and as I read from the back forward um, my question that continually popped up is, does this budget meet the needs of Pond Cove Elementary School? Because if I look at the test results, <coughs> and it appears to me that there are students in that school that must be struggling, and it seems like a large percentage, which if we addressed from the, the base up, then does it have a ripple effect into helping over time reduce the amount of um, academic special ed or any of those types of things? So my bottom line question is, how does this budget help build the foundation that the students need at Pond Cove Elementary School to move forward and be successful in middle school? That is a very good question, and I'm happy to kind of answer it preliminarily and then hand it on to people who know more. Um, what I can say is that um, we thought really carefully about this, and the Ponco staff and administration brought those specific concerns forward um, in asking specifically for three extra paraprofessionals. The, uh, the, the, I'd say pie in the sky wish was for five, which would be one paraprofessional or educational technician per grade level. Um, budgetarily, that just didn't work. But we met with teachers and um, administrators and, and had them really talk to us about what is it like in this school? What is happening? And they talked about RTI, which is response to intervention, which I find to be kind of just fancy word for helping students who are struggling. And they talked about how they, at Pond Cove right now, can't do what they really need to do for these students who are struggling. At the same time, they really can't do what they need to do to help the students who are in the gifted and talented side of the bell curve. So you've got both populations of students who are not quite <coughs> getting what they need. And with the addition of these paraprofessionals really specifically targeting that ability to get in there and help provide support so that they can be in the classroom with a teacher, the teacher can be helping one group, the paraprofessional can be helping another group. It increases the teacher's ability to plan because they're, they're covering, perhaps covering lunch one day less a week or something like that, that they can get together and work with each other and make plans for these students, look at data about these students and 
even work with these students to help fill in these gaps so that later on we can see them succeed, but you know, in a monetary sense, you spend less if you work harder at the beginning and, and really help catch those students up. I, and when I think of especially reading at Hong Kong, they're learning to read and hope that, that they're really proficient. I'm going to try to remember by third grade, Kelly, because soon they're reading to learn and it switches. And, and it becomes a huge, difficult gap the longer that goes on. So that's kind of the long answer to, I don't know that this budget is perfect, but it is a great step in the right direction in, in addressing exactly what you're talking about. So the, the, the question that follows that is that um, if <coughs> we were to increase the staffing for Pong Cove Elementary School uh, in order to meet the needs of XYZ students that are struggling, at what point do we loop back and say, we made progress? How do we do that? Um, I don't know if Kelly wants to answer that specifically, but my understanding is that there are multiple checks. I don't know, weekly, monthly, that sort of thing, to, to make sure that students are making progress. But Kelly, would you be willing to answer that? I don't want to start making stuff up. Thank you, Councilor Jordan, for asking that really important question because we see it as vital. It's a really good question because how we would how would we, we would monitor that progress would be taking a baseline as we do now, but every, every periodically, and it would depend on which cohort of students we're looking at, those who might need more intensified support, those who are progressing at grade level or above, but we would take a baseline of data using a variety of data points, uh, different types of assessments, and then we would be checking through month to month very often, many of our data points, our assessments that we use, are administered in fall, winter, spring. Some fall, fall and spring. The MEAs that you hear about a lot, the state assessments, those are year to year, but those also are a good barometer for how we're doing as a school and meeting needs. It's only, we're only looking at grades three and four. However, it also informs us how are those students progressing through the grades. So if that answers your question, how? If, if, if I can just I, join in. I, uh, uh, Kelly, are you through? I don't want to butt in. Are you through? Yeah, do me. OK, so I just want to just add to what Kelly was saying. L let me point out some of the um, things that are in this budget that we think address your point. And we don't disagree that the, the, our, the more we can do to give children a strong foundation with, uh, with their academics and a, a love for school and having good behavior, the more likely that they're going to be successful going on. And the, we want to get that soon established for the children. But we, there are, there's only maybe one position I can think of that might go away in time. The rest of them, I think, are, are, are longstanding. I mean, we want to go to a full-time gifted and talented teacher and he or she would work with, with um, Han Cove and the middle school. The State Department of Education recently told us that they think we ought to have two gifted and talented teachers. So right now, believe it or not, we have a 25% gifted and talented teacher. That's all we have, not, not even half time. So we think as a minimum, we need one full time and the state is saying we really need two, but okay, we're gonna go with one. I don't think it's, we're ever gonna go backwards if this gets approved. We're hiring, as, as, as Elizabeth said, three special education paraprofessionals. Those aren't gonna go away. Those people are doing really complicated work. They aren't just in a ditto room running paper for people. They're really working with children and supporting teachers. And we need to give teachers the time to be able to plan and, 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 and work with children in small groups and, and, to, and, and to design units for the professionals to work with. And that's gonna give the children more small group 
direct work, and it's going to give the teacher more time to catch her breath and do the planning that that's required that just simply can't get done right now because of the pace that they're traveling at. We have got this budget, and we're moving a teacher back into being what we're calling an interventionist, meaning that the teacher works directly with children at Pond Cove on, I believe it's reading. I don't know what's reading or math, but it's, it, it's, it's remedial work. We probably are always going to need that. So that's not going to be the one position that might be temporary, temporary meaning a few years, might be the behavioral. We're hiring a behavioral specialist to try and work with children and families and teachers to try and keep the classroom respectful and manageable and work with children that have got some real complicated needs so that they aren't disrupting the class for all the other children. Maybe some point in time we'll be skilled enough and we'll have fewer children with those needs that we wouldn't need that position. That's the only one I can think about that's going to maybe go away. The rest of them we actually need long term. And so, you know, I think that, if I'm right, every classroom at Pond Cove has got a teacher in it. We're at capacity. Am, 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 I, am I right about that, Kelly, that we don't have any free open classrooms? No. Right, so we've all, got all every classrooms, classroom we have, filled. We have 30 classrooms. Right. We're, we're, we're within uh, or close to being within board guidelines for classroom uh, teacher-student ratio. We, we, we're kind of at a max right now. If that helps answer your question. No, it does. And, and I just want to throw out something that I think what would be helpful, and I'll, I'll throw this out to the school board, is that these things that we talk about here, like, uh, okay, if we invest X number of dollars, what's the return on that investment? If that next year, when you come back and we have budget again, that we, we demonstrate here's the progress we made based on that investment. And on a, um, and this is just me because I, I spent many years in remedial reading. The more words you put on a page, the less I comprehend. Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, bulletize things, mm -hmm. get your point across, and say this is what we achieved based on the investment mm -hmm. that we moved with in this town. So just my suggestion. What I would like to call your attention to is that this year we do have um, a new program or position evaluation uh -huh. section where every, every program or position that was new has an evaluation in here with um, a description, a purpose, mm -hmm. goals and objectives, and that sort of thing. And that is just the paper. On top, you know, before, around, and after that paper, there are large discussions talking about was this effective? Was it the most efficient way to do it? Did, you know, how effective was it? That uh -huh. sort of thing. So um, I guess what I'm asking is so in this, Format, would you like to see? I'd put a page on top of it with a summary with bullets. And if you want, I could have done that for you while I was sitting having coffee. <laughs> but that's really, it's the takeaways. Mm -hmm. Then I can go into the detail. Mm -hmm. So. Very helpful. I agree. Thanks for that feedback. Yeah. Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, Any, any comments on the, the that first section of highlights and the master budget? We can, <coughs> so we'll just sort of proceed with sections. And Are we still working on the sections? Well, th this was, Penny's was kind of an uber section, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, would, it all came up to here. This is the summary. That's fine. It was great questions. Um, but I just thought, well, you know, let's maybe keep a, a progression, and if we kind of go sideways, that's okay. Anything else on the, that budget master or highlights? Of this section? Yeah, anything else on that? I have several questions. Okay, Councilor Ray. Okay, first question, page 17. Um, school board department. Professional services budgeted for $750 for the current year, but suspended at 13813 Can you tell me what that is? I know something. Page 17. Yep. Are we in the master? We're in the budget master. Okay, page yep. 17 of 52 in the budget master. 
Uh, Council Ray, will you, would you repeat your question? Yes. Um, Department 9001 School Board Professional Services budgeted for $750 for this year, but it's expended at $13,813. I'm wondering what that difference is. Sure. I don't. I don't expect you necessarily to answer. You know, right off the cuff. But if you could get back to us, that would be great. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Catherine's going to get back to you on that one. Okay. Is that where we've left it? Yep. She's fine. Well, that's fine. That's what it is. It's your superintendent search. Wouldn't that be what it, what it would be? Uh, it, the super school board, you with main school management? I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's a 3,000. Yeah. So, I guess I'm not trying to put you on the spot. That's fine. Um, so. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, did somebody else? No, no, there you go. Okay. My next question um, in that same section is on page 33. Um, special education for Pond Cove, uh, increase of 62,259. Um, teachers move from self contained accounts to resource room accounts. For special ed regulations, Cape Elizabeth does not have, have self contained classrooms. So is there an offset in another part of the budget for that? Because it looks like it was moved from somewhere, and I didn't know if there was an offset that I'm missing somewhere. That's what I wrote. Right here. We have self-contained classrooms throughout the three schools, or there are budget lines for those. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that that's the case. So, so there's an offset number for this? Yes. Okay. Yes, there is. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, next. You can always stop me if somebody else wants a chance. No. Huh? Finding my little red stickies. Um, okay, <coughs> page 39 of 52, the same section. Um, capital improvements. There's a large decrease of $319,300. It says reduced because of budget constraints. And I know we've had multiple discussions about the CIP in the past few years. Where did that 319 three go? Okay, um, so page 44 of 52, um, there's initial proposals not included in this budget. Um, again, another piece, $439,600 additional CIP. Do we know what that, how that breaks down? So, so if I'm understanding this, there's additional CIP money that was not added to this budget. There was some that was moved. This was not added, but I don't know what these items are. Well, this is a long, long process. Back in the beginning of February, when we did the very first rendition of this budget, we had over $900,000 in CIP, which was an increase from the previous year. But then we dropped that down. So the number you see in the very detailed um, small print is the decrease from just the previous year. The number you see in that proposal um, is the change from what we had, had originally proposed in our initial budget this year. So that's why one number is 300000 the other number is 400000 if, if I can just add to that response, <coughs> my understanding is that at some point in time, I don't know when it was, maybe 10 years ago, 
the school CIP budget was something around $150,000. I wouldn't want to be held to those numbers, but it was a very small number. And over time, um, when I believe when debt service was retiring on certain projects, the amount of money that was in the budget to pay off the debt rolled into the CIP and, and it grew to somewhere around $19,000. And it was, it, 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 was, it was not raising new money, you'd already, you'd already been paying it towards something and now you were applying it to CIP. And this year when we saw the original proposal for um, the $900,000, this is a, a, I'm rounding off the numbers right now, but $900,000 but proposal for CIP, about 400 and some thousand of that was for a uh, addition of a, of a room at the high school to address the needs of, of uh, improving the, the um, locker rooms, um, weight room, and perhaps a classroom. It was, a, it was a adding a, a space at the high school over by the, 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 the gym. And we agreed in the CIP that we, we are rushing that. It, we, we aren't debating that, that there's a need. We're debating if we have really thought it out well enough and if we've included enough in that proposal. At the same time, we, we got the word that we were losing $800,000 in state revenues for the school. So we said, let's take that building that we know we don't have to have, that, that four and some thousand dollars, and just take that out of CIP. And, then we, and that saved, that reduced that budget by that amount, and, and, and therefore reduced the impact on the budget, if you follow me. In the CIP that the board will be receiving this year, the proposal now, we have reformed a committee. That budget includes a proposal to go out and hire an, an architectural firm to come in and study all of our buildings, not just the high school. The, the, as Elizabeth said earlier, the study we have is at least five years old. And these buildings, you can believe me, need attention. They're just that's just the facts. And we want to have somebody come in who is from the outside, who's uh, got a background in looking at, at schools, and go through each of them with a fine tooth comb and provide us with, with a report next year that says, this is the condition of your buildings, this is what needs to be done, this is the priority of that, and this is the cost of doing that work. And, and then the, the board and the council can wonder if that is appealing and, uh, and something that you would want to put before the voters as a bond project. We, that could be a year or two down the road. I, I, don't, I don't know when it's going to happen, but we would hope to do the study next year. So it's, it's a long way of saying that we took money that had, and by the way, everything else by, by, basically that we needed in the CIP is covered in the $450,000 that remains. It was just that building that we felt, you know what, we don't have to do this right now. So that's, that, that's why there's this confusion around CIP. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> could, can we stick on that topic for one second? Um, could you uh, maybe explain a little bit more the breakdown between some of the projects that fall into CIP and others that are just under the custodial and operations budget? Because um, I think that that probably needs some clarification. Do, do you want to do that? Or, or? Uh, Ray Marles and facilities director and I are always having a conversation on what is the difference between a capital improvement and what the CIP stands for, a capital improvement plan, oh, there versus a non-capital improvement idea uh, of work. Um, <laughs> capital improvement projects are the big ticket projects that you only, like a roof, is a capital improvement project. You only do those every 30 years. A new boiler is a capital improvement project. A new athletic room with classrooms and stuff, that's a capital improvement project. Um, there are other things that we have to pay for every, every year, like maintenance on the boilers. That is not capital improvement. Um, normally, just regular painting is not really a capital improvement. That is just regular maintenance that needs to be done on a regular basis. 
That is basically the difference between a capital improvement project and a non-capital improvement project. Is it something that has to be done on a regular or annual basis just to keep the status quo and running properly? It's kind of like preventive maintenance. Whereas capital improvement projects are the big projects that happen every so many years or so. That's one way to look at it. Uh, qualitatively speaking, or subjectively, however you want to put it, um, does anybody on the school board have an opinion on sort of the greater state of need right now between some of those preventative maintenance things and some of the longer range capital improvements? I have to say that I wish that our um, representative to the Buildings and Grounds Committee was here because I think she would be able to state very well that um, we have some custodial or just regular maintenance, not necessarily capital improvement issues that really take priority right now. And um, maybe Howard could speak a little bit more to that, but I know. Well, I. I I, I think that um, it's fair to say that we have the need to spend more right now than maybe uh, we have in the past on what you might call uh, operational expenses. Things as basic as um, uh, as painting and, and, and basic cleaning and repairing ceiling tiles and uh, electrical work really basic stuff and I think that there's an obvious need right now to step up our commitment there. Um, we also have the things that would be normally under a capital uh, a CIP plan like replacing windows, door frames, um, door locks. Um, I don't just mean the large brand new buildings, I mean the basic core of a building that, that, that would normally be in, in a CIP. We're, we're behind the eight ball, in, in my opinion, on, on a lot of this. And we need to really um, commit to a plan of really upgrading this so that it is presentable and, and it feels respectful and, and states the value the community places on education. Um, healthy. Pardon me? Healthy, too. And healthy. So I would say that we need to, um, if anything, we need to expand uh, our efforts on basic operational maintenance work for the for foreseeable future. Um, one thing I'd just like, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, just, I wanted to say that something because I was with Heather at one of the last meetings she had in, uh, for the uh, building and maintenance and also toured with Heather and um, Greg Models and our uh, middle school just to, to see the state of the current state of affairs of just one building that day. And um, in, a, in a perfect world, we would be able to address all these, these uh, needs um, on an annual basis, but um, there's a lot that needs to be done to just maintain what we have, which is not necessarily considered CIP spending, it's more maintenance. Um, and you know, it, it's hard to put a money, monetary value on it because so much of it has to do with morale, with pride, with um, you know, curbside appeal for our schools, um, for people coming to our town. But I think you asked for a school board's opinion on this, and quite frankly, I, I think we need some elbow grease physically on our schools. But when it comes to budget, it can't, that cannot be the students have to come first. Thank you. Um, I would request um, that for future um, I, I, I don't know if we would have the opportunity to do it before um, the council takes its vote on the 15th. Or there, is that when our meeting is 15th for voting on the budget? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, if there's an opportunity, it would be great for counselors to have a chance to visit the facilities, either formally or informally. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I have two children in the schools, and I was in one of them recently and shown some of the very things that you're talking about and as a parent of kids in the school i was surprised at the condition of the schools um, the middle school in particular 
Um, so if you haven't been in the schools recently, I encourage you to go. Um, I'm sure that building administration would make, you know, right. make, you know, the facilities available to us. Um, because I think you'd find it rather eye-opening. So, anyway, thanks. Just to follow up on that, what would be your ideal outcome of doing that? Do you think if we went and saw the schools, we would be say, oh, let's give an extra hundred thousand into that budget? I'm mean, I just if the schools need that maintenance and, and upkeep, then why isn't it in the budget to, to start with, I guess, to me? If, if you think that we're going to be so driven by a visit, then parents should be driven by that same thing, and the taxpayers should be driven, and they shouldn't, not that they shouldn't care, but they shouldn't be as shell-shocked by the budget if those are true needs of the school. So I'm just surprised that it's not in there as an, a need right now. Were you asking me a question? Or? Well, just like, yeah, I mean, you're the one who proposed that if we could go see the schools well, before we adopt the budget, would the idea be that no. when we got to that adoption, we'd say, you know what, we all went to the schools, we're going to throw an extra 100000 or whatever the need would be onto your budget number that we're going to send to the voters. I mean, is that what you would think the outcome is? Because if that's the request, then yeah, I'll go visit the school tomorrow because I think the schools need what they need. So if that's what it's going to take to get everybody else on here to, to say let's put the budget up, then let's do it. My, my point, if I could just answer quickly, my, my point about going to visit the schools um, is that, number one, I think we have a responsibility to be as, form, as informed about um, the issue as we can. And if, um, you know, if, we're, if we're voting about something that is such a large portion of our municipal budget, and none of us has even been in a school recently, I think that's frankly neglectful. Um, second of all, uh, I'm not suggesting that we just say, oh, I went to the school, so let's throw more money, but it also helps in understanding the prioritization of need, to say these are the things that are being superseded because there's a commitment to funding something else. So if, if, um, if one if one can see like well geez these are real big problems but they must value this so much more because we're we're bumping this down the priority list it helps put things in the in I think a grander sort of spectrum of, of need and priority but the first point is I think the more important one that um, you know for us to be voting on a school budget I think we should be you know you know we've got great information here that's provided by the school board and all the, all the people that put the work to go into this, um, but it also helps to be close to the product mm -hmm. and, and see, you know, see it for ourselves, that's all. Jamie, you had asked for a list of things that were under consideration, and although <clears throat> we haven't finalized, because there's a committee of both teachers and school board members and facilities folks who are going through and helping prioritize, some of the things that have risen to our attention include replacing exterior doors that are rusting or failing, um, replacing an awning that had to be removed because the snow load made it fall down over the winter. Um, there's a school fire detection system change that's required. There's the alarm one day went off in Palm Cove, but it didn't go off in the middle school, and yet they share the same building. Yes. Um, so those things need to be sort of looked at. <coughs> There's electrical communication and build out of new achievement center in the library. They're sort of meeting students' needs and moving some of the things that are in the current achievement center and bringing them down into the learning commons for the high school. Um, phase three window replacement programming for leaking or not functioning or single pane windows that are um, heat loss or gain over the winter, over summer and winter. Those are the types of things that this committee is considering how to prioritize it and what we need to do. And the playground at, at Pond Cove is another example. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think that the, the board would be happy to facilitate it for at any time, and though it may not have a direct impact on vote or numbers as far as this particular budget, I think it's great to um, have everybody understand what we're talking about as far as our facilities and it obviously helps conversations down the road and understanding um, how these issues are cropping up and and what may need to be seen to at a higher priority later 
Thank you. Um, I have a, uh, some comments and questions related to this item, unless anyone else. Mr. Boltz? <laughs> We looked at this budget and set our priorities. This was what we think we can do and still support student learning. And I think Howard has flagged, and we flagged a couple of times, we think some of this maintenance and CIP issue is a bigger, broader issue, and we plan to address it in a comprehensive way, and that's why coming up <coughs> we're looking at a study so that we can do that in a way that is comprehensive. That's my understanding of where we're going with this, because it's not just a little extra paint. It's sort of a more pervasive problem, and that's how we need to address it, so that we can explain it and understand it fully and get the advice of experts who can weigh in on what that really costs and what the trade-offs are. So the, <clears throat> we're not tackling that hill this year, especially with a state subsidy being what it was. So. Councilor Leonard, do you want to go ahead? No, you go ahead. Oh. I just have a quick huge general question. Do you guys ever talk to the state, meet with our representatives, go talk to Jim Ryer, and generally sort of advocate slash explain how profoundly difficult this is for, you know, even Cape Elizabeth to, first of all, absorb the, the magnitude of the cut, and second of all, absorb the incredible unpredictability of it? Um, I mean, that's the elephant in the room. That's what we're all talking about, right? If the state would treat us even vaguely fairly, we wouldn't be tearing our hair out over this. And, you know, if we were a private organization, we would hire a lobbyist. So I'm just curious, like, do you have any contact with the state just so they know what you go through? And does it help at all? May, 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 may I just say that I've been incredibly impressed by the work of Rebecca Millet and I'm sure others as well. She's just the person I have met the most. But believe me, she is in the front row on this. Mm -hmm. And she is working uh, hard to support her representative area, but the state as a whole, she's, she's out there and making it really clear and she's being very articulate. And I think she's having a real impact. But there's a qu quite, as you know and read about, a struggle going on between the legislature and the uh, Appropriations Committee and the governor and their budgets are just, they aren't lined up at all. Um, there is a limited amount of money available for school construction work. I think that, uh, I'm not as familiar with it right now as I have been in the past about the, 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 how one applies. I've, I've done that successfully in the past, but I think they've changed the formula. I think we would wait a very long time to ever reach the the small group, very small group that gets any funding. I'm not that, even talking about the building in our CIP. I'm just talking about our year-to-year -year budget. Oh, I think that, um, I know that a number, that, that the school board association um, is, is, is always presenting in front of the appropriations committee and uh, the education committee. The main um, school superintendents association as their advocates, and, and they're out there as well. Um, I, I believe that the, the MEA is, is out there, the, the main Educators Association, and they're pushing hard. I mean, there are a lot of people that are saying this just isn't working, and we need, uh, we need to, to, to honor the commitment that has been made in the past to provide, I think, 55% of the cost of education, and, and come on, let's do that. But um, it, 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 there's just a, a, a major struggle going on. Thank you. I know that I myself, and I'm sure other board members, I'm sorry, about that, um, have had multiple conversations with Rebecca, um, with Kim Monahan. Um, they're very supportive, and um, there's just so much that they themselves can do. Um, there has been advocacy by our superintendent, by neighboring superintendents together, all working to try to address this. It, it just, it's just <coughs> wild. I mean, you look at this chart and you can see the swings are so wild, unpredictable, and just, it's difficult to absorb. And it's, it's an untenable situation. So the answer is yes, there is advocacy. I was just going to add, there's been 
in the last five years, I think two years of attempts at the Learning Commission, when mm -hmm. we look at the funding program. And, and those who look at it cynically say, whatever funding formula is presented to the legislature, the vote will be, what's your impact on your district? So it's still very myopic. It's very much, what does this do to us? The commission the governor has now that Artalia actually sits on, their, their bigger interest isn't the volatility of CAPES funding. Their bigger interest is equity across the state. So we're not really high on their list of worries, to be perfectly honest. So but right now with the funding, uh, based on what it is, property valuation goes up slightly, enrollment drops a tiny bit, and you see these huge swings. But we're not at the top of the list in terms of their worries. I, w I really am hopeful every time another commission gets together, they come up with really an equitable, sustainable way for us to look at uh, school funding. But so far, not, not getting there. Thank you. I, I have some comments and concerns on this section um, of the budget, the um, facilities and the CIP uh, capital improvement plan. And I, you know, I noticed when I was first going through that, that $319,000 that was removed. And then I noticed the, the 400000 later. Also, we had no narrative in this section as compared to last year. So I wasn't able to, you know, read anything to get a an explanation of that. Um, I, I found uh, some of that this to be puzzling. And what I would um, like to uh, mention is that uh, my understanding of, of operations in the capital improvement uh, plan was that it's, it's budgeted every year, as we do in the municipal side. So there's money in that for things like painting and so forth. Um, so I'm wondering. Uh, if we need to have a project, <clears throat> a project uh, progression page, because you know we bonded 7.9 million in 2004 for the high school, we we refinanced that, freed up some of that money. We bonded, I believe, it was a 1.4 million just two years ago when we added that to the library bond for the schools. Um, we did the Harriman study. The town council paid $25,000 for the Harriman study in 2012 or 13, I believe. And that has extensive um, architectural and engineering report on the school building. So I'm wondering if you are you know, saying it's not in this budget, but if you're saying <coughs> that you would be interested in requesting another architectural study. Um, we, I mean, we had one fairly recently. So I, I think that probably a project, for, uh, a, a um, progress report is what I really want to say, for all the, you know, the monies that have been bonded and spent so far um, on the school buildings and facilities might really be in order to help because you've got, you know, in your budget here, five-year capital planning, you've got a total of $6 billion and you, you've got sections of that set aside for bond, it says. And, um, you know, I mean, for example, I thought we've already paid for roof, roof repairs, but I see more roof repairs in this. So there's one example of, you know, some, to me, which looks like I'm confusing, some discrepancies. I don't really quite understand it. I asked the town manager for a little more information from facilities, and, and Apparently, there's even looking at a $4 million bond for bond projects and just even mentioning that weight room that you mentioned, Howard. So I, you know, what I would, would like to see is something that's, uh, you know, more concept, comprehensive document about that because we, we have been spending quite a lot of money um, on the school building. So, and um, I would like to see um, what the funding, the regular funding has been. I mean, I understand that, you know, you had that had a subsidy shortfall, but uh, you know, maintaining the buildings and um, you know, obviously, is a critical thing to do. Right. But the taxpayer has been supporting a great deal of that, so I think some sort of a more detailed progress report on everything is yeah. probably in order. Um, so that's something I would request. I'm going to make a note of that because that would really fall on the shoulders of our shared facilities director, Greg Marles. Mm -hmm. And um, he has done progress reports for us in the past, but I think it's absolutely appropriate, reasonable. 
so we can have him get that information. I, I think it, it should be available <coughs> right now. <laughs> Thank you. And, and just, I think you're very wise to have brought up the Hederman report. It did guide us for a number of years in addressing some of the most immediate of needs. Many of those needs were actually flagged as needing to meet federal ADA requirements or even building code mm -hmm. that we took care of right away. But that was over five years ago, because that came out when I came <coughs> to the school board six years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, and, 2013, I believe. And it's still from data or assessment that's over five years old. And we have a building, we have buildings with hundreds of doors and thousands of windows and metal that just rust in this environment. That's just one portion. I mean, our buildings take a beating mm -hmm. with the kids in and out. And so I think Howard was wise to maybe suggest um, revisiting and maybe just doing an update to that report or a subsequent report so that we can have a, a as John pointed out, yeah. an expert opinion about what we really do need to prioritize. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for being here. Councilor Ray? I'm going to circle back to my comments about the CIP. Um, <coughs> back in 2004, we did an $8 million renovation to the high school. And at the time, 7.9, at the time, um, there were a lot of um, townspeople that said, why aren't you maintaining these buildings? And we, so we put $7.9 million into the high school. And when you talk about student needs, student needs are a bunch of things, including working in buildings that are well-maintained. Mm -hmm. So I am not um, in support of reducing the CIP budget and then potentially sending something out to bond. Um, the weight room that I saw in there, the weight room and the lockers and the trainer's room and so forth, what's in there is $750,000. These are big numbers. And if we don't maintain the buildings, we're, we're going to end up having to spend more to renovate them later. So um, I am not pleased to see the CIP budget being cut um, for something else. Um, and, you know, I'll just say that because what I'm hearing is this building's falling down, this roof's caving in, this is that and the other thing. So I know 2004 was a long time ago, but $8 million was voted on by the uh, voters of Cape Elizabeth, and they put that money into that building. And that was the same time that we built the kindergarten wing at Pond Cove because we were moving the kindergarten out of the high school back to the Pond Cove. So there's, I think, uh, you know, echo what Jessica said is we've put a lot of money into these buildings and it's not okay to me to not maintain them, at least in a decent, um, you know, respect, uh, paint and if the doors needs to be fixed. And I don't think we need to spend a lot of money to go out and get a lot of opinions on what needs to be done when it's pretty obvious that we've cut the, the, we, the school budget proposes some significant cuts to the CIP budget, so. Thank you. May, uh, may I respond to Yes, sure. May, I hope you know that you're, you're speaking to the converted here. I mean, we are in, in disagreement. I, a question I have is when that bond that, that bond you, you're referring to, that was, 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 was it seven or eight million dollars? 7.9. 7.9. Yeah. Did that include the pool? I don't <laughs> recall. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. I don't remember. I you see. could look it up, I'm sure. Yeah. No, the pool was not in there. Pool was not on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, but I um, mean, we, you know, we got, for lack of a better term, we got beat up by some pe people in town saying, hey, wait a minute, why weren't you maintaining these buildings? going through the same thing we're going now where we took some trips and we went in the building and this is falling down and that's falling down and so forth and so when we came to discussing this bond there were people that said I'll vote for the bond but you better keep those buildings maintained and I'm just bringing this up because I think you potentially are going to go back down that path if, you know if you don't maintain the buildings and I'm not talking about big projects and obviously there's things that have to be done you know and there are certain 
certain schedules. But I think that's one of the reasons that we put together this request for an ongoing CIP budget so that we weren't stung again um, by buildings that were really um, in, in poor shape. And I echo what uh, Jamie said. I understand there was a problem with the leaking ceiling and so forth. And I consider that part of what's best for students, is right. to have a building that they can they work in. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying right. I'm looking for that to be in the budget, and it's not there. And I think we potentially run down the road of, of irritating <laughs> the taxpayers and the voters of Cape Elizabeth. So. Thank you. Council Lennon? I would just be cautious of cause and effect. I don't think that the renovation on the high school was a result of not maintaining the buildings and painting the walls. The, the, it's apples and oranges. I mean, it's hard to maintain the buildings to the degree they need and educate students and keep the percentage of tax increase where all of us, including the voter, will accept it when the state cuts money every year. I mean, it, it, we're in a box we, that, that, that you can't really get out of. But that, that renovation is separate, I think, from the annual upkeep of the buildings. The renovation right. was necessary because the building's almost 50 years old. And it's worth noting that if we lived in almost any other town, especially one that didn't have such high property valuation, we would be on the short list of, of the state paying us to replace that building. Right. It's, it's a concrete box. It's, it's extremely old. It's, it's a heat sieve. And it's unfortunate that we don't have the money and the taxpayers would probably never um, approve a complete uh, replace, tear down and replacement of that building, although, it, you know, ultimately it's going to have to happen at some point. So the fact that it's almost 50 years old and we're still putting band-aids on and keeping it together and it's serving our needs, I think is a testament to the long-range planning and the um, fiscal, you know, genius of the people year after year who manage somehow to, to keep it going. But, you know, the, the Alternative Energy Commission basically said, the best way you can save on energy costs is to tear that building down and replace it with a right size, you know, green, modern building. We can't do that, but I'm just saying, it's, I, I think it's really hard to ding the school board on not maintaining it, ergo we never have to put any money into upkeep and renovation. It's just, it's just what an old building does. It always, it's like an old house, you always have to be putting money into it. And I will note that there's a difference between CIP and operations, and painting rooms and that sort of maintenance is operational. It's not CIP. So, and, and trying to find the source of that crazy leak in the sixth grade wing where there's a hole, I think has been ongoing for years. It's, it's not that it's not in the budget. It's, I think it's frankly they can't find it. They're trying. But it's... I mean, that, that I think falls under operations versus CIP. So, uh, you know, I, I, Sarah, you're kind of, you're on the right track with, it's, the school board wants to maintain these buildings. Um, I think we can see next door in South Portland what happens if you truly let your buildings go and then what has to happen. Yes, there's a gorgeous high school in Boyer, they paying for it, but I mean, the board does have high priority on maintaining these buildings. Thank you. Any more comments on that or on this section in the budget? One more on yep. this section. Uh, you, can you speak a little bit more to the decision around the unassigned fund balance? Um, I know that there was a lot of discussion last year around what was a large drawdown um, to plug a hole last year, and then this year we're looking at nearly twice that. Um, so maybe just a little bit more detail on that. I, I believe that um, the the state sets a, a limit on how a percent you can hold in your unfunded, uh, uh, <coughs> undesignated fund balance, which is I think 3% of your operating budget. Um, we, I, I remember meeting with um, your, your past talented manager early on uh, last fall where he was really trying to point out to me that he was wondering um, and, and I think he was speaking for perhaps the council if our fund balance really needed to be as high as it was. I mean, were there some things that we could do to use that money perhaps for one time only expenditures that would reduce that and in the, in the long term save the town. So something like that. So 
it's been, uh, 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 th th that figure has been of interest uh, f to the, the town for some time now. We, um, to, to keep the budget tax increased to the voters as low as possible, drew, I think it was $800,000 out of that total amount as a, um, as in a sense, a revenue source knowing that probably this year, at the end of the year, we're going to have some amount of money unspent in this year's budget. I'm going to guess this could be at least $200,000. And that would, 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 would go back into that line. And so rather than being down, let's say, just, oh, this is hypothetical, rather than being down 800000 <coughs> on that earlier figure, you're down six. And, the, the, and then to try and keep that somewhere closer maybe to, the board has not given me any direction about what percent they want to always see in there, but they feel that they worked hard, they've been careful and cautious with their money, and that's been kind of their, uh, you know, they, they worked hard to kind of get that protection. Um, and, and I appreciate that. But I think that we can be, I don't feel that we're rolling the dice uh, by taking $800,000 out of that to help reduce. If we don't do that, we're simply adding to the cost of the, 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 uh, the, the tax increase. We don't want to do that. And I don't think we're being foolish um, or irresponsible in taking this out, because again, I think that we're going to be able to build it back up in time. It's just going to be, we have to be careful about this. So it's, it's, it, that's, the, I, that's basically what the thinking was behind this. I mean, why would we want to hold on to that money and raise more taxes when we have money in the bank that I could help reduce that? That just doesn't seem fair. I guess thing. the other question to follow on to that would be, how do we keep winding up with money accumulating in it as opposed to, I mean, I, I know it's part of general savings that occurs throughout the year typically, not hardly ever from getting extra revenue. Right. Um, so, uh, but, and I know, I know that a great deal of effort goes into, you know, being very accurate with the budget projections, but um, I mean, that, if that fund just keeps building up over time, it says to me that either, you know, either we can do some better sharpening of the pencil on the forecasting to begin with, or yeah. um, I, 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 it, we're fortunate to have the money there for the purpose that it's been allocated for this year. Right. But also, I'm just struck by, Sort of the variability of the fund level, and then you know, rather than just have it parked there, sitting there for right to tap into in situations like this, to be potentially more accurate with, right. with the projections to begin with. So. Well, I don't know what it's like for you all, the town side, but I don't think it's all unusual for schools. I mean, I get really nervous if I'm below one percent at the end. I mean, that, that to me is sh shaving it really close. So, I, I mean. One percent is around two hundred and forty thousand dollars. So, I, I think that we're having more than that, and that means that we should be sharpening that pencil. So something's. I mean, my guess is that part of that is um, it, it has to do with, with personnel. Part of it has to do. In other words, we hire people and we budget understandably uh, um, in that mid-range, so that we aren't cut short. Cut, we aren't cut short, but. Sometimes we hire people that cost less. There's a savings there. People, we, but people are on a certain health insurance plan, and all of a sudden they go from a family plan to a single plan. That's ten thousand dollars on just one person. I mean, it, pretty quickly it, you, you can see a, a lot of change in just personnel cost. Um, but we need to be looking at, at, at historically which accounts are under and over it, and. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to count on us doing that. I, I don't know what the, the, the records show us in terms of which accounts seem to historically be over, and, and that, that, that begs the question. Uh, and I don't, I'm sorry, but I, don't, I can't tell you tonight which those accounts those are. Um, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. just, if I just yeah. follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Councilor Garvin, I, th I think, you know, to Alan's point, uh, the 1%, more or less on a $24 million budget, I'd say they're uh, doing very well as far as you know, coming back with the, you know, finding savings that take place, and uh, to do that, it's kind of like I don't know, it's just such a small 
percentage when you think about such a large number. So it does give you the opportunity to try to, uh, you know, you will find efficiencies that do flow, but on a $24 million budget, 240 grand isn't really a, a not to downplay a quarter of a million bucks, but it's still not a heck of a lot of money um, in the long run. If you can, if you can, if you can hit that with a 99%, and I would agree with Howard if I was less than 1% away from where I was, I would, let's just say my seat wouldn't be very comfortable. Uh, by the end of the year, I wouldn't want to be flying that close to the margin. So uh, I think that's that's just sound, sound financial reporting. And then you know, and then the, and then applying that in future years to to use to to offset. You know what your needs may be. You know through an unassigned fund balance policy, where you could look at how you're going to allocate those funds. You know you could put it to the CIP. You could put it to you know buying down the tax rate. There's different avenues of, in which you could invest that money into or allocate it to. But uh, usually at the end of the year, that's you know that's you, those are decisions. That's a first world problem, I guess, to have after you uh, after you get through your accounting or your audit phase. It's better than the alternative, for sure. It, it is much better than the alternative. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, are we done with that section? Move on to enrollment and staffing. Any any comments or questions <coughs> on that? In that tab, Councilor Garvin. I wonder. Uh, I don't know if you if you know or not, but um, if you could talk a little bit more about um, the work that goes into the recommendation or forecast from planning decisions. What factors they use. Um, what. Um, as was noted, you know, at least in the most recent couple of years here, they've been off a little bit, but um, just in, in general, what goes into that, and, and if you could inform us a little bit about that. Uh, the question has to do with staffing, uh, uh, no, given no, enrollments. Enrollment. Just planning decisions, what, what metrics they use. Yeah, exactly. Well, Aside from the crystal ball on the data. <laughs> I, I, I can't, first of all, I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. I'm going to guess that it's something like what I'm used to, which is that you look at your current enrollments and you, you anticipate um, your kindergarten enrollments based on contacting various, you know, preschools, hospitals, um, people that, you know, just come into school and say, by the way, I got some new neighbor. I mean, you, you, you're guessing on kindergarten and, and the rest of it, you're, you're assuming that the, the, the trend is that you're going to have about as many kids in those grades the following year as you do this year. I mean, it's, it's, not very, it's not strictly scientific, but by and large, that's what we do. Um, I mean, I think it, 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 it's really important to remember that we take seriously the, the, uh, the board's guidelines on on staffing, in some cases, as I said earlier, like take Pond Co, for example, we're going to those those um, those class sizes are going to are, are going to only increase if we were to find an unexpected number of, a spurt of, of, of students because we have no more room to hire more teachers. We're just and our numbers are anything but so small that we're wondering about, well, could we, could we eliminate a teacher or two? We aren't even close to that right now. We may be at some point, we aren't there right now. Our, we're, we have, um, I think, um, acceptable, they aren't too large, they aren't too small. They're a little bit, if anything, they're on the, a little bit on the large size, I, I would think, for, 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 for an elementary school. We have this bubble going into the eighth grade next year at the middle school. We're addressing that by hiring one more teacher. It's a one-year hire. That teacher may move with those students to the high school the next year. We don't know that. But we're hiring one more teacher for the eighth grade because that class has just historically been a much larger class. Um, the high school, the class sizes are, are very in line with other schools, uh, other high schools. We we run very few small classes. Some of them we do intentionally because we want to offer those courses to expose the students from a wide range of courses that we think a comprehensive high school in this community would expect from us. But nothing, any class below 10, the principal and I sit down and we're sure that we're both comfortable with that. If not, the class doesn't make. Um, but we basically go with the enrollments that we have currently 
and do our best. Um, I, mean, I think that they're doing kindergarten signups now. Is, 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 is that correct, correct, Kelly? Yeah. So, <coughs> I, I mean, we're we're a little bit gun shy of the projections that we see out there because, as as Elizabeth pointed out, they're wrong, and they're wrong in terms of being they're too low. We're seeing larger numbers than the, than those studies are showing us. Not huge, but but larger. So what's the point? I would just add that um, my understanding is they use blackboard quiz. Yeah. And they use the same housing start data. But in general, what they can't anticipate is turnover from a sales of house of how many kids might be coming in. And that's where it gets really volatile because a house with no children suddenly has six. A house with six children suddenly has two. You know, that's the part where they will say, we cannot project house turnover rates. We can just tell you live birth, preschool numbers, what we think will be coming in. And my experience was the same. It's generally lower than what we experience. I, I, I know that even this week, I think that we've registered at least four children that are coming in this week. Not waiting until next school year, but starting our school the last week of April. I mean, it, it just, it's just, it, 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 it's, it, it's a moving target. And my other question on um, enrollment is um, we had a handout that, and we've got it in various materials in the book too, um, tracking enrollment from 2001 through projected fiscal 15, uh, fiscal 18, sorry. And from 01 through 0506, we had a steady upward climb. Um, and I just wonder for some of the folks that have either been on the council or the school board longer, or just have a better recollection about this, sort of what was occurring in the community at that time, if anybody recalls, um, prior to the, the slow downward trend that we've seen, just what was, what was occurring before that high water mark was hit? Anybody so I, I, would, I would like to respond by saying that before you brought that question up, that was something that I wanted to highlight as sort of an opportunity if we wanted to start a business. No, really, the, there is a lack of not just gathering data, but understanding what was happening to drive that data. And so, I mean, here we are tonight and you're asking for some anecdotal help. Is there anybody in the room that remembers what was going on? I think that's a real lack in the service that can be provided to us right now. And um, I think all, all we can do at this time is probably try to document for our own future and edification kind of what our trends are and what might be going on so that our, you know, our future boards and councils can know what's going on. But um, I can't answer your question. I can just echo that I think it's I would say Cross question. Hill was being built. Bingo. Yeah. Well, yeah, 96, 96 homes uh, basically came online yeah. from about 1999 to about 2006 in the town, and it was in. Yeah, you're adding about 20. And a lot of building going on in the back. That, that period, yeah. And that's, uh, from my old right. assessor days. But that's just a safe big tax assessor's <laughs> mouth. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think the, the the other thing that's happening is actually post of that the increase. Is, um, and it, 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 it's unclear, but that was also the time where it uh, had a financial crisis and you saw a drop both here and nationwide in birth rates, which then has about a three, four, it's about a four or five year delay in terms of school starts. So it's not that the, um, many people, that, that they just delay having children. I think we saw probably some of that here. Birth rates are back somewhat, but not nearly back across the nation and, and in Cumberland <coughs> County back to what they had been prior to the crash, but they're up some. And they also saw uh, a real freeze in the housing market, which meant that housing turnover was much, much lower than it had historically been, which limited opportunities for people moving in and out of the community. And usually when people are moving in, it's often with children. So you had a freeze on that um, net positive effect on enrollment, as well as the delay of the birth rates, which may have had some effect. I'm not, you know, it's hard to say when they'll come back, but I'm, I, I think that that was some of what was affecting the, the decreases. Because housing units are up, population is still up, family sizes have been down. Just like the yeah. punctuation I would put on this too is, and it, it's maybe less pertinent to the specific 17-18 uh, budget, but 
Um, and if I knew this for sure, I'd go out and buy a lottery ticket tonight. But um, I suspect that this trend is going to, at the very least, flatten out and potentially even turn back the other way. Um, you know, we've had a lot of other conversations around the aging population in town. You know, I know, you know, even within my own family, uh, you know, my, you know, where, where the houses, as you said, the housing stock is not turning over. Um, you've got people staying in their homes longer, but that's going to swing. And when it does, this is going to either, like I said, flatten out or go the other way. You're right. So, while there might not be an immediate impact to the 17-18 budget, um, it's something that I think we all need to be mindful of um, as we're thinking about this as a very big picture item relating to budgeting on a year-over-year -year basis and and taking a longitudinal view of it. So, thank if, you. I would like to ask you that if you were to talk to the real estate agents in town, that during those volatile springs where towns across the nation were seriously hurt in the crash of 08, the housing stock maintained its value here in town, and it was mostly cited because of those who wanted to either stay here because they valued the school district, or they moved here because of they valued the school district. So there's an, an enormous amount of um, equity in this town that we can market and help keep our housing stock stable. Yep. Just one, yep. one other additional point to consider, uh, Piper Shores also had a large uh, out migration from the northern part of Cape Elizabeth, kind of uh, your mountain view, island view, ocean view, the northern part of town had a major turnover that happened roughly in 2001 to about 2006 where you saw a lot of younger families that actually moved in to that section of the community in, in somewhere in line with Ms. Powers' uh, thought there that there was, a, there was a pretty significant change that took place in that part of town as well at that during that time period. So that plus the Cross Hill uh, number. So you had some in-migration, some out-migration of older families that went to other, you know, what basically graduated to Piper Shores, so for what it's worth. And then we have more development on the horizon. Right. Uh, two, potentially. Um, any more comments on this section? I'd like to uh, basically take a wellness check. It's close to nine o'clock. We're not finished. Um, we could take a break and continue on. We could take a five minute break and continue. Um, we could stop and res resume tomorrow night. Um, what is, what do people think? Would you like to take a quick break and then try to push through for another hour or what are people thinking? Keep, we have a one, one for keep at it. Okay. Can we set an end deadline? Yeah, like, let's do that. We'll be done by 9.30, so we'll sort of pace ourselves along. Well. Or something, you know. In other words, if it's open-ended, we could go to midnight. Well, um, you so know, I, I was thinking more the lines of perhaps, <laughs> you know, set at 10 o'clock myself. I don't know that 9.30 would be adequate, but maybe we could shoot for 10. What do folks think about that as, as a hard stop? I'll try. <laughs> or try. Let's shoot for 9.30 with a little wiggle room, and then we'll, we'll be efficient. Well, it's like a running race. Let's do it. All right. All right. Would, well, I would, re I would recommend a quick break now, since we've been sitting for two hours. And there are some light refreshments, and, you know, we have restrooms nearby, so. Okay. We'll be back in five minutes. <laughs>
Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. And that was a nice quick break that I think we all needed. And moving on. Uh, yes. If you would like, um, we were able to get some information that people had requested. If you would like that, it was the um, most recent update on charter students. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, as of school year 2017, we have 19 students enrolled at charter schools. Thank you. Versus last year, we were at 14. Okay. Can I just add one thing to, to, mm -hmm. to Matt's point about Gray getting so hurt by, I think it was Fiddlehead Elementary that opened and 40 yeah. children went there. Yeah. Um, a couple years ago, because of legislative action, I'm, it's coming back to me, it gets fuzzy. Instead of charging individual schools 19 tuitions for whether our kids are doing homeschooling and doing the online charters, going to Baxter, whatever their choices are, they, the, the amount of cost for charters, which is billed out at the same amount you're allowed to charge tuition, it's about 10,000 a student, came directly out of the state budget and went over into the charter school costs. So instead of Gray having to pay 400,000 for their tuitions, it just was it just was taken out overall from the state. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're not billed anymore. It just reduces the GPA for everyone, so everyone's hit that's by right. the kids that are out at charters. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think we're it seems like we're all set with the enrollment and staffing section. No. No, I'm sorry. No. Councilor Ray. Sorry. I have a bunch of questions. Um, so um, I refer back to the spreadsheet that uh, Jessica gave to us. And um, I see that in 2001, our enrollment was 1,736 students. Excuse me. And our budget was 13, the, the school budget was 13,617,956 students. The dollars, excuse me. So now the projected student enrollment for 2018 is 1,571 students, or a reduction of 165 since 2001. And our budget is now $24,879,014. Um, in addition, our staffing, as our student population is going down, our staffing has gone up. And um, I'm concerned about that opposite trend. Um, now, the council, of course, does not tell the school department um, how to place their staff. And they um, obviously can place them where they want and where their needs are. And we've heard about some needs tonight. Um, but I'm concerned about the numbers going up. And I asked for some information um, through Jessica and received it. And one of the things that I've noticed is a trend, at least from 2003, that salaries and, but, salaries and benefits for the school budget continues to creep up. So in my mind, that leaves less money for other things. Um, so in 2003, 77.57% of the school budget was in salaries and benefits. 2018, it's 83.11%. So to me, that, that chokes out some other things that might be of importance. Um, and that concerns me. Um, you know, I, I know that there's needs that, that are, seems like there's some needs that are unmet that we've heard about this evening. And I'm wondering how much we are shifting staff um, versus hiring additional staff, because it looks to me like our staff creep is going up. Um, and um, I'm concerned about that and would be interested in the superintendent's um, take on that. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know so well, the school budget is 
primarily made up of personnel costs. I mean, that's, what, that's just the way it is. Um, and I don't know what year it was that the school board decided to go to full-time kindergarten, but whenever that year, whatever that year, from that point on, we added some number of, of teachers just so that the children could have full-day kindergarten. Before that, it was half-day. So that would be part of the answer as to why do we have more teachers, but the answer in part, partially, is that we went to full-day kindergarten. Um, I, I know that we have specialized services. I, I don't believe our classroom teachers would say that, um, that they feel um, this expansion. I think it's outside of the regular classroom where we're seeing most of the expansions, is my impression. It's, it's people who are um, working um, as specialists. Um, we've got, I don't know how many, I don't know the history of, of, how, of when we started having social workers and, and when we went from one to two, but all I know is that the social workers, for example, as one specialized group, are incredibly busy. Um, doing important work, trying to help children and their families. And we have, I don't know when we hired, we went to this model of having um, specialized teachers working with children with reading and math who are, 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 are needing remedial support. But we have in, in elementary schools now, I believe, in the budget for next year, two at, at Pond Cove and two at the middle school I, I doubt that those were always there. There are things that, which are things that we're doing um, that we should be doing that have added staff, but I don't think that it's, 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 it's the classroom teacher. I think it's those that support children outside of the classroom. And I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't identify for you all the examples, <coughs> but um, yes, salaries have gone up, benefits have gone up, but I would say that Cape Elizabeth, this, this next year's cost increase for health benefits is not an anomaly. The year rates here have been incredibly low for some number of years. We're very, very fortunate. Um, but yet, still, it's a, it, you know, overall, it's a cost increase. Salaries are going up. The teachers here are, are, um, are not the highest paid teachers um, in, the, in the state. Um, the, the certainly competitive, but I, I think that the cost increase overall is about additional staff who are specialists, not salaries, not health benefits. That's my, my impression. I would add um, that what we need to do for education is change, and so we now have um, technology specialists that, that are helping our students we learn do. how to be 21st century citizens. And we have people who are working with children that don't speak English as their native tongue. We didn't always have that as another example. Um, the budget includes a, as I said before, a gifted and talented teacher. You brought that up as well. Um, that's overdue. Um, May I just add that as a district, when you compare what we spend per student, compared to our other surrounding districts, that we're one of the second lowest in the region for cost for people in delivering the education that we do to our students. And I can't think of a better way to spend the money in our budget than on the people who actually work with our students every single day to ensure that they have an equal and equitable ability to live in the classroom. And so by putting that philosophy first, that's what is been reflected in this budget. We added a position a while ago to support students at the high school that needed um, additional support and alternatives. But two, actually, there are two positions. And I don't give those two positions total credit for this, but they certainly have an impact on <clears throat> reducing the dropout rate. Um, we, we know this, that every child that drops out of high school is likely going to, most often going to struggle. And they're going to cost, they're not going to earn as much in a lifetime, and many of them sadly end up um, 
being incarcerated. Not all of them. I don't mean to suggest if you're a dropout, you're going to be um, a criminal. I'm not saying that at all. But the fact is, it's, it's a cost to society. And we're better off spending the money on staffing to try and keep kids in school, have them earn a diploma, have a, a future, and in some kind of a direction. And so I think that's money well spent. Um, it's on the front side of it. Do we know what the dropout rate is? Our dropout rate is less than 1%. Yeah. Thank you. That would be the point. Zero eight, uh, or something. Uh, Mm -hmm. Did you have any other questions, Council Ray? No, I'll let somebody else ask the questions. Anyone else? Enrollment and enrollment and staffing? Can I, can I just, if you go to your page that's 7 of 10 in the enrollment section, it tells the story that you just articulated, which if you look at it, you see teachers have stayed, regular teachers have stayed a little bit flat. It's been a shifting and an increase in special ed. Right. And there's been a investment in, um, I would say, ed tech threes right. versus having one. So it tells the story that you, you just okay. described, you which that. would say that uh, you've got higher paid people, uh, you probably have longevity of teachers, so if we are retaining teachers, I did, I tried to create a graph from this while you guys were talking, you got this, this peak of these teachers within the 10 to 15 year range that are going to be highly compensated, which is causing our, our staffing numbers to go up. Right. And so uh, it's like the wonderful thing is that people want to stay in Cape Elizabeth. The challenging thing is people want to stay in Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> so, uh, so we have experienced teachers. Right. So I think it tells the story. I think the challenge is that we need to take a deep breath and say, okay, are there any tweaks that can be made within that, that staffing that still helps us achieve the goals that we want to achieve um, and, uh, and see if we can you know, kick the tires a little or sharpen the pencil or and whatever. And to that point, we are moving some teachers around next year. I, I didn't mention that earlier, but we have teachers moving to meet the needs of the students between yep. schools next yep. year. And that's the other, the other thing is, is that one of your initial objectives was really um, effective use of resources. I don't think you used the word effective, but I think that's what you meant, is how do we take and align the resources we have to achieve the greatest results for the students? That's what I assume you meant. Okay. I, I have a question. Um, what are uh, what are your projections next year for losing teachers by attrition, and are they all being replaced? We have, um, I believe, four or five teachers retiring, or who have, or or are moving to an, another area, like even out of state. So I think we have about maybe at the most a half a dozen, and I believe um, that we intend to replace each of them. Um, the exception, wait a minute, I'm not sure, there's a, one position at the high school, that's right, 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 so right, there is one, one shift to the middle school from the high school, but the others through um, retirement or, or, or resignation are being replaced. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Grannon? Yeah, maybe there's some place in here where this is. Um, I know that when they're looking at new teachers, um, Kelly, you have uh, five teachers, looks like, that they're bringing on for the cost of $233,000. Is there a list of what we have for, specifically, you've got five leaving, five coming in, the new hires, what the costs are in one place? And like Kelly's, what you, what's in here? So, is it like six new teachers? There's no? No, I don't think so. You know, well, what, what we do, I think, is that when a teacher, say a teacher retires, and getting back to the point about a veteran teacher earning more money for good reason, 
we don't budget that salary for the replacement. We used to go to, like, say, a, a step 10 with a master's degree, kind of in the middle of the salary schedule, and we plug in that. So we go with the lower, um, no matter what, that's kind of where we are. We, 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 we try our best to know about retirements early enough to where we can um, make those adjustments to the budget, but it's pretty much across the board. It's step 10 master's degree. I'm going to try to answer. I'm just, I was confused. Just how, by, by the numbers. Council didn't ask for five new teachers. There was a, a proposal for five ed techs. Right, five ed techs. And that was not granted. We are, um, they, we've added three ed techs instead. It's, they ended up with three. Oh, with three? Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's on the summary page. Okay, so this is where I think I was a little confused. I'm sorry. Trying to, uh, right. right. Maybe those, like you said, the front pages, had those go, bullets. Right. You had nice. to go backwards and it, it the summary ends up up here. Yeah, so so. I think that's, that's right. I mean, I spent right. Some, yeah. So the format, I think, this year was to allow the administrators to show what they felt was really needed and, and, and be allowed to advocate for that. And although we, we just didn't feel like we were able to, to do that, we still felt like it should be visible. Okay. It's on this page. Up front. Oh, versus what? And handouts. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. And then handouts. Yes. Okay. Okay. These are non-special education educational technicians, and they will work under the direction of teacher to um, support students and be given assignments. And then that allows the teacher time herself to work with another group of students. We had thought initially that it'd be optimal to have one per grade level, as Elizabeth said, but it just, it just didn't feel that the budget could support it. Okay. I've got a question. So there, because uh, I was a little confused as well, there are how many ed techs being added on top three. of three? These are, these are regular regular ed instruction, ed. and mm -hmm. then you have special ed techs coming yes. on board as well. And how many of those? Well, now that's. I don't know that we have any no? new ed techs and special and, no, ed. No, well, no, we could special. next year, depending on new no, children yeah, coming in know. and their IEPs requiring it. So that's a, a, a moving target. Sure, okay. But um, when. Kelly Hassan was talking about art, the uh, RTI. RTI. That's regular instruction. That's right. Those are, that's the same thing. It's one <coughs> students, but not necessarily special ed students. It's right. Students who they're just not doing well in math, or they're not doing well in reading, and they're really falling behind their yeah. peers. The, the, and, the ed, right. Yeah. The ed techs that are working in special ed are often assigned to one child, and they support that child. They eat lunch with that child. They help them calm down, they help them with their work, they, they're outside during lunchtime, and they're just like a, 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 <coughs> um, an adult who is assigned to that child, but at the most, two children during the day. Mm -hmm. These, the that we're talking about adding to the budget are generalists, and they would be in a classroom and moving between teachers to work with students in small groups to help them maybe with their math or with reading <coughs> or doing a, a project, um, and it's nothing to do with special ed. Okay. And the reason, there, uh, I just want to just clarify, those special ed professionals or paraprofessionals are really not allowed to work with regular ed. They're assigned and they're funded specifically for special ed students. So they're not a resource. Okay. Thank you. A anyone else on that section? All right, let's moving on. Uh, we, the next section is uh, the new, new programs, new programs, position evaluations. Uh, Elizabeth went over that uh, in her presentation, but does anyone have specific questions on that section? I, I do, on page five of 10. I just thought this a halftime position. This is a um, technology integrator. It seemed to me that a, a half position at forty-seven thousand dollars was quite high. Is that? I mean, it's about benefits included, I guess. But if that were a full-time position, that would be pretty pretty pricey. It seems high for half of a a half position. I, I'm assuming that this is salary. I'm not sure. Um, 
It says it says salary benefits, but it just it just seemed that forty seven thousand dollars for a half time position was a, was high. That's all. Um, a full uh, a full time teacher mm -hmm. salary and benefits for a full time teacher is over eighty thousand. So for you know, like entry level, or I mean, um, I, that would be a that is about a master's a wow. person with a master's and okay. six years Plus, uh, the teacher that's doing this is, is a veteran teacher. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just thought that was a high number. Um, is there anyone else? Any questions? Councilor Ray? Um, can you tell me what a student-driven driven learning coordinator is? Um, I mean, I read through it, and um, you have one now and you're going to maintain it or I wasn't quite sure I understood what that person does. <clears throat> Is this oh, I'm sorry, page three of ten. I'm sorry. Right. Jeff, do you want to answer that question? Sure. Would you mind? Yeah. <laughs> so, so this yep. is, and Anyway, this, this is not a new position. This is a position, and it's really a half-time position. So some of you may know we have a full-time person who works half-time as a volunteer coordinator. He replaced Gail Schmader, who retired a couple of years ago. The other half of his position is as what's called the extended learning opportunity coordinator. What that has translated into a good chunk of that time is coordinating our student-driven learning program, which is basically the idea that particularly for juniors and seniors, to give them an opportunity to, to propose projects, propose um, areas of interest that they'd like to really explore on their own, that they are, driving the, they are driving the learning, Kathy. And the idea is that they work with teachers within the school and they work with outside people who are experts in the area. So we have students who are, um, we have one student who's researching some neuroscience projects. We have a few students who are creating videos. We have students who are writing plays. Um, um, and so those, there's a whole variety of things that kids are doing, but that's, and, and right now I think it's, eight, it's somewhere between 18 and 25 people, Kathy, I can't remember exactly how many it is, but this, the proposal is not to add to that position, the proposal is to continue an existing position. So they, the students sort of report, this is the person that oversees what they're doing? That's correct. Okay. That's Thanks. correct. Thanks. Yep, Thanks. sure. I had a question. Um, in special ed, uh, there are two new positions. I'm not sure. I was confused. Is an office manager and is there a secretary as well? That's she's one person. I think it's one person. It's one person. Okay. Yeah. And uh, okay. And um, thank you. Anyone else? On the enrollment staffing. Okay. Um, and now we're into the schools, Pond Cove and middle school and high school. Any any further questions on? Did you? Oh, did I skip something? I'm sorry. No. No, I don't. Okay. Anything on the schools? I have a question on the high school. Okay, Councilor Lennon. I was just going to ask. Jeff always up there. The proficiency-based education and evaluation. That's been a long ongoing project, right? to train teachers how to do that. Um, so my question is, one, did that require money to, i.e. time for the teachers, or was that just thrown in addition? And my second question is, is that actually gonna be put in place, and is it is Augusta standing by that requirement? <laughs> so right now, my. Um, I'm not aware of any signs from Augusta that they are backing away from that requirement, Sarah. Um, so, and, and so next year will be the first year of implementation of proficiency-based education beginning with our incoming ninth grade class. Um, the major investment really has been teacher time, as your question suggests. Um, there, is no, there, are, there are some state funds, but relatively small number, to help with some training and professional development, but a lot of it is really the work of teachers on 
professional development days, and I anticipate there's going to be a good amount of work. Um, there's been a lot that's been accomplished this summer. We'll be communicating with parents in the not too distant future about the way we see this unfolding. Um, and but there will be a considerable amount of, of work during the summer using professional development money essentially to support it as well so that we're ready to go. And is it replacing the old way of evaluating or is it in addition to the ABCD old-fashioned way? So it's, it, we're really building a system in terms of the reporting um, that will feel, that will feel like it, it fairly traditional but it will provide parents more detail, more granular detail about how our kids are doing on particular areas of learning within a particular class. So they will get the traditional grades, they will get additional information as well. Does that, that, that answer? Yeah. Okay, sure. If I could just add, uh, uh, add to that, don't mind. I started reading um, pretty, pretty soon after the election that uh, on the federal level, but which but basically that's what, what what's driving this. This is a federal requirement um, that there is some there's been some talk about the the federal government is going to um, walk away from this. So if if that were to happen, and and I we have no what I I, I, I don't I, it's it's hard to follow what's going on with the Department of Education right now for me. But if that were to happen, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't know if Maine would continue on its own. I, I don't know if there's that much passion behind this. So it, was, it, was, it was a re reaction and response to a mandate. So, that, so I think there's this jury still out on that about its future. Um, and you know, with the No Child um, Left Behind Act, that ultimately, what people thought would never go away, that was gone at some point, and I, I'm going to expect this is going to happen too. So if we can just make whatever changes that we make, ones that we would want to make anyway, and the ones we believe in, then even if this does go away, we haven't lost, as long as we just stick with what we, we think is best for our students. But there's a real cost to us in this. I mean, it, it, it includes, it, it, it's also the, te the new teacher evaluation uh, guidelines are connected to, to all of this. And, 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 and it's taken a lot of time for teachers and principals to implement, to, to design and implement this new process. And, and now we're going to have this requirement that students must be able to show proficiency in order to earn a diploma four years from now. Um, and it's taking a lot of time of teachers, as Mr. Shedd said, during the year and in the summer on volunteer committees to do all this work. And, that's our budget. I mean, we're paying for this. Um, it, it, in a, in a sense, it's an unfunded mandate. Right, but I mean, so many of those unfunded mandates come and then disappear just as you right. invested. Can't you sort of delay and postpone till the dust settles? <laughs> well, I think that I don't mean postpone, but Not um, like how we're doing I mean, we aren't rushing blindly into this, and um, I, I think again, as long as we do what we really think. We would want to do no matter if even if there was no mandate, right. Right. we're probably on pretty on, on a pretty good foundation. Yeah. Um, and I, I just hope that we, uh, that's what we do. Council Jordan, I have a question on middle school, and I heard you um, I heard you say that uh, adding an eighth grade teacher because the cohort is large. It right. looks like the cohort for sixth grade is larger. Um, and on page uh, one of two under uh, the middle school, it states that adding a sixth grade teacher. So what's being added within the middle school? Can you kind of articulate that? Because I'm a little confused. Yeah. I think that there's one, I, 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 um, the middle school principal is not here this evening. He would give you the best answer. I can't, I can't wait to tease him tomorrow for forgetting about being here tonight. Um, but I think that what I, if I've got it right, there is one new position okay. for the middle school. And that position is teacher moving from the high school to 
the middle school. It's brand new. And then another teaching position that was in, I think, grade five is moving to grade six. So a person who was assigned to one grade level is being transferred to, uh, I believe, a higher grade. Okay. And so, but that's not new, it's just a new assignment. Okay. Doesn't that tie in last year from the, from the Palm Cove to the fifth grade? And that's someone in the Palm Cove. Someone in the Palm Cove. Okay, thank you. Any, any more questions on the schools? Councilor Ray? Um, okay, so middle school, page one of two. Um, and I think this goes back to what uh, Penny was referencing, class size for the different grades, five, six, seven, and eight. If I'm understanding, and I might not be, f uh, fifth grade's going from six teachers to five? Have you caught up with me? This was, that was in, this is an old sheet, I think. Because, mm -hmm. Okay, it's an old sheet. I think it's gonna be six, seven, six, seven. Mm -hmm going down, okay. starting in fifth grade six. So it's reflected in the proposal at the bottom of the page? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, the reason I ask is, uh, I'll go back to class size, and um, we talked about this last year, um, when the class size was changed in December of 2015 to reflect ranges. But the ranges reduced the class size in most of our classes and teacher load um, when you get up into middle school and high school. And um, I'm looking at the class size without making some of those increases, and it's still very close to your current class size recommendation. So I, I, just, I just make that as an observation. Um, with the proposed changes, some of the class sizes are actually below your recommended size range. Um, so I, you know, I just. Um, yeah, I believe we've also had a historic um, increase of um, students matriculating in the fifth grade. So I think that that was yeah. taken into consideration with being close to the, you know, sort of the upper edge. If we took any additional students in, could those classes be on? Thank you. The other thing I've heard is that the uh, next year's eighth grade class is a, um, it, 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 how do I say this, is um, a handful. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the, you know, there's, there, there's, there's the, it, it, it's going to be useful to have an additional teacher for, for, for learning. Thank you. Any, anyone else? on schools. Okay. Facilities and transportation. I think we kind of have already covered that pretty well. Does anyone have any anything else on that? Okay. Now on to special ed. Uh, I think that was also covered nicely. Anyone, does anyone have anything additional on that? No? Athletics. No? Debt service, technology, food service. I'm kind of going through, but I don't see any hands up or anything. And then special funds. All set? Okay. So this brings us to just another, another place on our agenda. Um, presentation <clears throat> of budget and tax history from 2000 to the present with projections to through 2030 uh, you all have documents um, you know that are referenced for this before we and I have a PowerPoint for this but before we do that I thought it might be a good opportunity for uh, the town manager to review the charts that you all got if anyone has any questions on those Any questions on the charts? Mr. Boltz? Uh, I'd like to make a change in the municipal budget numbers that were on the session in 
chart, they didn't seem to match with the top line signature changes. Um, I was wondering why that was. So looking at this is this sheet. Are you looking yeah, at the big, yep. the big spreadsheet? And what's his question? Or could you repeat the question? So when you're calculating the change in the municipal budget, the year over year change, um, the change percentage of the percent of difference is going to match up to the top line, changes to the top line numbers. I'm wondering why that was. Oh, okay, let me just uh, get there too. So you're looking about like online about halfway down the spreadsheet. Yep. Yeah. What we ultimately did, or what I ultimately did, what I would I would take the like, for example, 2018. Mm -hmm. I would take the the forecasted 12 million 221 number that we have uh, and, and 90. And then subtract the fiscal year 17, look at the difference, and then take the difference of that, that's $168,000, and then I would take that and subtract, uh, divide that by the, uh, the previous year's number okay. to, to have what my growth would be. Just double check that. So from 17, we had 439, 668 of an increase from 16. It's actually less. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, I grabbed it. For some reason, that one's grabbing it. Yeah. yeah, it's grab, it's grabbing a cell that doesn't exist there. Uh, for some reason, it got dropped out. Okay. One before did I? Yeah, I've got a couple of them that looks like that. Um, it actually should be 3.8%, 3 not 4.8. I, I think the error is also Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's actually to our benefit. <laughs> <laughs> which is not a bad thing, but uh, yeah, it seems to be grabbing the wrong, not the cell I want to grab, so at least in a couple of them, but I can, yeah, there's about a one point, well, roughly one percentage, or three quarters to one percentage difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll just, I can double check that. So any other questions on uh, the charts that were created just just as a quick uh, swing back on on, on on that endless supply of charts that you received uh, you know a lot of them were just trying to look like try to get a feel for different trend lines that we were, we were all looking at uh, specific one I was talking to Catherine about it today earlier uh, the revenue sharing in the 279 numbers if you look at those it's kind of interesting just to see how the how the two lines almost pair out. You know, and you watch, you know, outside of the crazy spikes that take place, but the trend lines are pretty, they're kind of, they're kind of walking a parallel track. And so I thought that was, that was kind of telling uh, when you think about the, the situation that both the town and the school have both been facing for the better part of 18 years, uh, that you've been seeing a diminishment along there. And, uh, and the volatility specifically on the, from the 279 number uh, was, was particularly uh, troubling because you look at that and say, okay, it seemed like a good thing two years ago that $3.4 million came in, but ultimately it was like tying the boat up the high tide without enough rowing uh, to, to get to where you needed to be. So, you know, ultimately you're probably looking at about, you know, over that whole, tr you know, over 20 years or 18 years, you're looking at about 2.4 is what the average general purpose aid education number that was coming to the, to the town or to the school was. 
but they throw it off for some of these odd years. And look at what we're receiving this year, like a million eight thirty one, and back in two thousand five we got five thousand dollars less. So there's no rhyme or reason to it. So you kind of start to realize, you know, certain things that are there. And then on the town side, you see, well, we used to receive close to eight hundred thousand dollars, and uh, you know, it's been a slow decline all along. And specifically, you know, over the past. I don't know if this is a coincidence or not, but over the six past six or so years, we've seen the numbers change you know, traditionally each year. It just keeps dropping down by a little bit each year, 10%, 10% or so like that. So mm -hmm. you can watch that trend line uh, show up. And then, and then there was another one that was pretty darn busy. Uh, actually, the one, the, the pie chart that I had, I thought was, was telling, if you look at the overall, uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks just I always want to know what percentage of the school, town, county is as far as what you know, what percent out of every dollar is going to going to who or going to satisfy which budget. I thought that one was fairly good. It's actually even over the 18 year period, you're looking at about 65 percent for the school side and about 30, 32 to 33 percent for the town. The county, on the other hand, is you know quietly got a little bit bigger each year. So uh, that's just the bill that we pass through to our fortunate taxpayers in the town of Cape Elizabeth and every other town in Cumberland County, but they seem to have about a 5% annual growth, uh, which is like, going to be a challenge at some point in time. Uh, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> we have high hopes. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, the last part, uh, that was kind of a busy chart to look at, but it, it kind of juxtaposed the, uh, the town, uh, the town, uh, the total, the town and the school tax rates in comparison to what the CPIU and the cost of living adjustments that, that a lot of uh, folks will want to take a look at on an annual, annualized basis. And there are two, there are two charts that have, uh, that uh, you know, you think about that, they have no relationship whatsoever mathematically, but when you want to look at what their trend lines look like, it's pretty cool because you can see how, you know, the, they've all been kind of bumping along fairly flat and stable whereas the CPI and, the, and specifically cost of living, because you think about that with, with especially with seniors in town, uh, you know, the, the COLA that they're looking at on the social security mm -hmm. side of it, a couple of years they gave them zero. So you can yeah. see why there's a question that, that exists where folks say, okay, I live on a fixed budget in the town. Uh, I don't care where my tax dollars go. I have a hard time keeping up with that. So that's kind of, you're just trying to give you a visual as to what the challenges you might find with uh, some of the some folks in the community may have, as well as the CPIU of the Northeast is something that a lot of folks tend to, tend to gravitate, gravitate to when they're looking at, uh, looking at what may be a sustainable uh, rate of change uh, you know, in, in your expenditures. They say, well, uh, the cost of living only went up by so much, so, I mean, I've been... Can I inquire about Sure. The CPI, as you know, is a basket of different totally. expenses, and oftentimes, when people look at CPI, uh, it's the best they pick specific region. Yeah, that's why you just pick a specific region. Um, and the CPI includes in it, and in fact, um, what people are often looking at, they'll exclude food and energy costs because they're highly volatile. Right. And so when food and energy, food costs go up, would go down, you don't expect the school budget to go down. When energy costs skyrocket, you don't expect the school budget to go up. And so. But within CPI, there are things that do look more like uh, costs you would expect for housing. So if you look at something more, which is a component of CPI Northeast, like owner's equivalent of rent, um, that actually tracks much more closely with what you would expect on the housing cost. And so our seniors, they're seeing their CPI, which is their energy costs, their food costs, and their housing costs, and our property taxes are part of that housing cost. Our housing costs, uh, the property taxes, track the CPI, uh, the owner's equity equivalent portion, much more closely. And so if you're looking at the wrong reference point, you may often reach the wrong conclusion. So if you're an energy company, you've got to know what's happening to energy prices. If you're a food company, you've got to know what are my food consumers having to pay. And if we're talking about property taxes, housing costs are the things that we need to pay attention to. And so I would think that if, you know, it's worth looking at what the housing cost piece is when you're looking at long-run sustainable pieces of, of And in fact, if you look at the um, owner's equivalent of rent, 
That's up, the most recent data is up about 2.6%. School budget is up about 2.4%. You're up about 1.4%. Five-year average, 10.4. School budget, 10.4. So we're tracking it pretty close on housing costs. And so that should be reflected in those seniors' full range of costs in their food, their energy, and their housing. So we're mindful of it, but you've got to use the right reference point if you use an indice. Now, again, this is still complicated because the CPI is just um, measured services. It doesn't talk about capital needs. Capital costs, those are excluded of it. And so they're not always going to track closely together. But it's a more relevant uh, cost comparison if you're going to look at service costs to understand what people are actually experiencing in their basket and what's our piece of the basket. Oh, no, yeah, I, I don't disagree at all. I just think, uh, you know, it's, it's one, of those, one of those measures that have traditionally been used in, in the town, so that's why, in, in many ways, why, why I tracked it in there. Um, the, last, the last thing I had, just to, uh, uh, just to circle back on it as far as the charts would go, um, when you look at the, the ongoing tax rates that take place, you can see, uh, as you track along, like, for 18 years, you can see that there are drops that take place. So uh, that wasn't a, a huge reduction in spending that year. It was actually those were years of revaluations in the community. So uh, you'll see, like in, from in 2003 to 2004, the tax rates go from about 22 bucks down to about 14 dollars. Well, that was a really that was a very significant revaluation. I still have the scar tissue from. Uh, so we went from about a, well, one point, or actually went from about 742 million to about 1.4 billion in value. And then, so. That's why the tax rate dropped so substantially that year. And then again, in 2011 to 2012, that was another year. So you see the graph kind of drop and then start to climb back up. So that's kind of, if you look at those years, it wasn't because we, you know, something catastrophic took place. Uh, well, I guess it depends upon your tax bill and like, <laughs> how you made out during that. But that's what ultimately, that was the impact on those years. So we're trying to figure out what happened. That, that was one of them. And then the last part I had on the forecasted increases, uh, which were uh, some of the later charts, that's taking trend lines out a long way, like to 2020, 25, and 30, and that's looking at what the existing average rate of change over those years was, and then forecasting that out. There are, there are other variables that exist between there that may impact that one way or the other, things such as uh, changes in funding that take place, that you know, if you restructured how we actually pay for our schools, or if you restructured how you actually, uh, you know, think about things that that are not known that may come in and impact. So, this is just taking current course and speed, if you will, and following that out. Uh, so, um, you'll see how, the, how how that may have impact over that over those over those years. Um, there are other things out there that do exist, like the three percent tax that may exist out there for incomes over $200,000 that may have an income directly to it. There's uh, uh, marijuana uh, as an impact that, that may, you know, the, the legalization of sale of marijuana may have something that exists that, that could flow down to, to schools and towns eventually. Um, there's crazy things out there like that that may, we may see as, as impact over, over the future. So. Yeah. Just what it's worth, that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at on that. But there's, there's a lot there to, to kick around. So. Thank you. If you have any other questions that come up, yeah, you can holler at me. And I, I've got a quick PowerPoint because that I wanted to uh, show it to everyone. And um, uh, so if you, you go ahead and take my computer and I'll just tee this up. It won't take very long. But I thought um, that I would give, I would try to give a, a big picture um, to the council and the school board as well, but so that we're not making a, a decision ultimately on the school board budget in a silo, I'm not looking just at that, but all, actually what, what does it all mean when we consider municipal budget as well? Because both budgets are asking for increases. And so I thought it would be prudent to take a, you know, 50,000 foot view of what we're, we're thinking of this year and um, whether that number is workable and whether we could do something a little smaller. So, um, let me do that. Let's see, I'm just 
trying to see if I can get that screen there, but it's not how No. Uh, you know what? It might be. Hang on. Dick. Yes. Should we get it on there? Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh but how do I? Because I, I want to skip through some because I already. All right. Okay. Here we go. I think this is it. Um, so just looking quickly at municipal data as well as uh, school data for the 2001 to 2018, on the municipal side, the average municipal department tax rate increase has been, and for those years, has been 2.8, 2.68, sorry. Um, Cape Elizabeth's population has remained steady at just over 9,000. Uh, and you know, this is, these are all referenced in the spreadsheet. Our staff numbers range from 85 to 90, but they have grown to 201 when we include on-call firefighters and EMT workers. Revenue sharing, we've received a total of over 11 million in, in this time frame, uh, from a high of 79, 799,000 down to our recent projection for 2018 of down to 402,000. We're down over 50%, and with revenue sharing, we have at a, we, it's been a very steady decline. Um, school data in uh, 2001 through 2018, we've had, uh, we've seen a 3.7 average tax rate increase. School enrollment, which you know we discuss, and and I'm sure the school board members are aware of this, but this is a an issue that. Some of us as, counsel as counselors do hear about regularly from citizens. From a peak enrollment in, of uh, 1847 in 2006, enrollment has declined to 1603 by 2017, and that's a drop of 244 students. And those, those are the actual numbers. Um, continued, the school department projects another drop by another 32 students next year, and you know we understand that's that's fluid. That may change. It may not be that much. But the 244 I just mentioned, those are you know that's an actual number. Um, staffing, you know, with the peak uh, enrollment of 1827, this is all school staff. It's not just teachers. It's all school staff numbered at 277.75 and projecting at 1571 next year, which may not actually, may be larger than that, your, your staffing number is uh, 268. So that hasn't gone down a whole lot, but it, you know, that's 10, 10 people. Um, general purpose aid to education, the state school subsidy since 2001, it's been a total of 44 million. And I thought it was very interesting that there have been lows lower than next year. The lowest, in fact, was in 2004 of 1,793,000. There was a high just, you know, 2016 of 3, 3 million point, you know, 3 point, uh, sorry, 3 million 403,000. So, you know, the big swings are, you know, have been happening. And uh, the average, the way I calculated it, was 2.5 million is what you receive on average from Augusta. And that's all in the spreadsheet. So, you know, there, you know, you, you do get an average of that, that amount, although there certainly is a volatility and you just don't know. But it was interesting to see that the all-time low in this time frame was uh, in 2004. Um, combined data, municipal budget average, average tax rate increase, 2.68%. School budget average tax rate increase, 37 And that's a combined of 6.38%. Now, this is 10 years. The numbers we had just before that were the 17-year the time frame. This is in 10 years. The numbers are, are lower. You know, and I like lower numbers. <laughs> for budget, but they're a little lower for the last 10 years, but still the average budget tax rate increase uh, with these is 4.9%. Uh, 
Um, and the current rate of increase in municipal and school taxes, assuming no additional borrowing, this is just what Matt was saying. Am I correct, Matt? Because I wasn't hearing everything you were turned away and I wasn't hearing everything you were saying, but um, assuming no additional borrowing, um, these are the projections. Uh, on a home value of 300,000, would see an increase above their, what they currently are paying of 2,856. Home value of 500,000 would see uh, uh, by 200, 2030, which is only 12 years away, an increase of 4,670 over what they're already paying. And then, then finally, a home value of a million is going to see $9,520 above what they're already paying. You know, can we sustain the rate? And that's, you know, that's just what I want to bring out. Again, I think that we need to look at everything, municipal and school combined. Um, can we sustain the rate of property tax growth we, we've been experiencing? Currently, we're proposing on the municipal side a 1.4% increase, which is $168,402 higher than last year. The school budget is proposing a 2.4% increase, which is 591469 <coughs> higher than last year for total proposed tax rate impact, so of 4.1%. That's what we're you know, proposing with both. I wanted to look at a scenario that drops it by 1%. And let me hit the what if. Both municipal school and school budgets drop by 1% each. This would decrease the tax rate impact from 4.1% to 3.1%. At 1.1%, instead of 1.4, municipal budget increases by 132, I'm sorry, 132,000 instead of 168,000. At 1.5, instead of 2.4%, the school budget increases by 372,805 instead of 591,000. The 1% decrease option results in a combined municipal and school budget increase of 2.6%, lower than the 10-year average of 4.9, and lower than the combined 17-year average, 17 average of 6.8. So that's what I just wanted to uh, present to everyone as a, a way to look at an alternative. I didn't obviously give you any higher alternatives, <laughs> but um, given that we've had you know, a significant increase in rate over the years and what projections could be for 12 years out from now, I thought it was prudent to take a look at you know, a smaller number so that we have a big picture in mind as we go forward. And that's it. Go back. Sure. Which one? Uh oh. I'm on my screen, Matt. I'm sorry. Uh oh. On my so screensaver page. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Under that scenario, how do you envision the process unfolding? Because it would be hard for paper citizens. They have to know what they're voting for. So are you saying the school board would go back and craft a whole well, new budget yeah. and educate the citizenry by June 6 or whenever? No, no. What, what I'm what I'm saying is that we have we have numbers before us. We have two. By what you know, what I'm offering is we have two municipal budget numbers. Because I personally don't think it's fair if we ask the school budget, the school department to decrease their budget, that we don't ask the municipal side to do that as well. So that's why I came up with that. What if both are dropped by one percent? I mean, I mean, it sounds great, but it's it's a living. Like, how do we process? How, how, in other words, what would that look like on the ground? I think parents would want to know, is it, are you cutting teachers? Are you closing down part of the school? Are you decreasing, well, are you increasing class? Like that's, that's months of, of recalculation. And so would we delay the vote or I, I don't know. No, 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 no. What would happen is if, if, we'd, if we approved a 1% a decrease in both municipal and, and school, school budget, then the school budget would do their own Figuring on where they take that money, where they how they take that off. They had already decreased it once. Their initial school budget was higher than the one they're presenting now. Right. So no. The question is, how would you educate? How would they have time to figure that out? Because it's a line by line process, and then educate the Cape citizens so they could figure out how to vote. Do they want to vote for it or against it? Too, too high, too low. 
assuming that people are paying attention, how would we have time to how would we have time to create a whole new budget and let the citizens know what that budget entails and what they're voting on? Well, the school department would adjust their budget if we if we ask them to decrease it to that number because we are the ones that decide what number goes to the voters. The school the the school department would then adjust their budget internally as they see fit. So would we. That's all. In time to then. Well, that, of course. To explain to mm -hmm. the citizens what they're Well, doing. they, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We, Jean, Jean, we I'm sorry. This, I go the same yes. So that, I guess Sarah's question mm -hmm. still stands. How would we get that all done? And I mean, we have these televised hearings that mm -hmm. the voters can be as informed about what they're voting on. So mm -hmm. what's your envision on, on cutting, because we have to cut $36,000 out of the budget. So how do you, how do you well, start playing out timetable-wise? Like, when will we well, do we that? We can do it whenever we want. The, the citizens aren't voting on the municipal budget, so we could do it at our leisure this summer. Okay. The school board has a deadline. They are voting on whatever. We, we, we've we already set aside the day June the schools. 13th. June 13th. They must vote. So, so that would mean that the school board would have to redo their whole budget and educate the citizenry on what that budget looks like before June 13th. That, well, that's it. That's bring it to you by May 15th. May, May 8th. Right. That, that seems to be a 30-day. Can someone right. help me Well, out? we, yes, we, we have our public hearing on the 8th at our regular council meeting, and then we, we actually vote on it on May 15th to stay within the 30 days. Um, Jamie, you had your hand up. I was just wondering if you could um, offer up a more detailed explanation of the rationale for 1% and why you think it... Um, why it has to be equal. Well, I thought it would be fair if it was the same decrease with both sides. I thought 1% was not a huge drop. I mean, it is a drop in a fair amount of money, I realize that, but I thought that that would be better. That would be a, a, an equitable number and a number that could be worked quickly. And, um, and then I asked the town manager to look at the numbers that would result in a 1% decrease. On the, on the municipal side, uh, we have had, ultimately, we're, I have two parts that we're looking at, revenue and expenditures. And on the, on the expenditure side, we do have a couple of changes that are going to take place, one of which is a, a salary adjustment on the assessing side uh, that we're, you know, now that we're close to the home stretch and uh, getting a new assessor, we found that's not going to be as much as we had forecast. And then uh, also on another part, on the tree budget, uh, we're not going to expend all that was set aside this year. So part of what another area I was looking at was as a carry forward, basically carrying forward 25000 I'm not spending this year, moving that into next year's budget. So decreasing that line, instead of being a $30,000 increase, it ends up being a $5,000 increase by pushing the carry forward into the next fiscal, budget, fiscal year. So just from mm -hmm. what I'm hearing, it sounds like we suddenly found a way to save 1% of our budget regardless. So we're going to counter by asking the school board to go find what we didn't, they didn't just happen to find like we did. So it's not exactly fair. We found 1% savings and then we're going to say, oh, because we were able to find it, you guys go dig it up. Also, they have, to, they have to cut three times what we have to no, cut. No, no. I, I think the genesis of this would be because of some of the, the conversations and the numbers on the spreadsheet. If you look yeah. at no, I understand where it's coming right. from. I'm just saying the ease of ours is, is, is much easier. Of our budget is what we're trying to tackle along. Right. So, but to, you're saying we clarify. found the savings and you're now doing the same thing as we did last year, is telling them at the same meeting, go find, go cut some more. To clarify it a little bit, though, um, it's not. It's not as. It's not as simple as not that. As simple as that. Yeah, it's not, it sounded simple. Yeah. Well, uh, no. You know, working with Jessica, like he had, trying to say, okay, what looks like a palatable increase on the tax rate, and you know, our discussions that we had at the council level with myself, like and saying, okay, you need to come in or try to come in at a point of so, you know, of only so much. And saying, okay, we can do that, and working from where we were back from, you know, from February forward all the way through our budgetary process. 
saying, okay, uh, this is this is what we're looking at for our best number that we had, and meeting that. But then looking at the overall number and you know what we're looking at with town and school, saying, okay, in order to try to, I mean, because listen, we're at 1.4 percent increase on the town side. That's about as Spartan as you're going to find as far as expenditures, expenditure-wise goes. Saying, okay. What can you also sacrifice to do there? And trying to look at that and saying, okay, well, you know, now we're getting further in the year. It wasn't like it was found money, but it was more like, okay, some things have changed since we got to that point. And saying, okay, well, we're still doing that, and we're we're coming in at 1.1 percent now on a municipal increase side of it. So it keep, keeps whittling down in order to have that number. So it is more. You know, the, there's some things that have to be pushed as well on the on the revenue side. I had to. But, but this is, to push a couple this there. doing it in the municipal is basically you. You can sit right. at your desk and you can shuffle some things and cut it and call a few department heads and say, is this okay with you? And they'll say, I guess I can swallow it. The school is a massive, a, a huge, much bigger operation. To cut that much money would be, they'd have to go back to department heads. They'd have to figure out, can I, can I cut a faculty? Where would I cut a faculty? I mean. It's, it's a massive process to figure that out. To, there, there's so many people involved in this budget, which has been going on now for nine or ten months. I just, I'm just baffled how you think in, the, in less than two weeks they can do that in a responsible way. I mean, I guess I could just say, like, okay, let's, let's throw the whole, um, you know, all our savings at it. Or, I mean, I, I just, I just... I think it's a great idea, but I think I don't understand how you think it's going to happen in two weeks. We have a public hearing, and we're supposed to vote that night. It's we vote the following week. Th then no, no. We well, we officially vote the fall. Okay, we vote the following right. week. So my point is, yeah, I would love for the school board budget to be less, but I, I'm completely baffled how you think this can be can be done. I mean, it, it's it's. I mean, let's hear from the school board. Can, can you guys envision a way? What how? You would literally have to. Have emergency meetings every night for the next ten nights for them to figure this out. I, I don't know if the working people there could. I mean, I, I just it, it just seems like like way too late in the game for me. It, it's I think they should have been introduced. Let them answer the question. Yep. Are you willing to jump in? Sure. Um, well, we the, the budget that has been outlined for you is our. Um, it's a serious budget. You, you, you know that. I mean, it's really been given a lot of thought and time. Um, there are things that we would love to have added that have been pulled out um, because we're trying to keep the increase uh, to a figure that we feel the voters could support. And we've cut, as you know, we've made some pretty big cuts in our budget. And we've gone over this tonight in order to get this number down. We, we, we feel that we're, we're, we're where we need to be. Now, if you feel as a town, uh, you represent the town that is important to cut, what um, I don't feel personally, unless the board directs me to, to have answers to what this is going to look like by the time that you vote the budget. I mean, we may. Um, we will do our, we're not going to drag it out, but you, but we, 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 will, we will handle it. We'll, we'll do what we have to do to get the budget to the figure that, that ultimately you can support. And that's going to take some time to really sit back and say, okay, what, how are we going to shave? It looks like about 225000 out of our budget. And that's what we'll do. And it isn't going to be the budget that we have worked on or presented or believe in. It'll be something less than that, and I, I, there's no, I don't see any value in, 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 in whining about it. If, if, if ultimately you think that that's what's best for the town and for the children and for the schools, knowing that the schools are a huge part of the town, then we're going to, we will come up and make the, make the adjustment. We're going to sit here and whine about it. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's another way to look at this, because uh, having been involved in, in budget processes and to have numbers, so can you hit this 1%, um, I think there's another way to ask the question, and that's that is there anything within that budget 
because uh, you've already found things that you have taken out. And uh, what I don't want to personally see happen is um, student education impacted. And I know that the salaries are, and benefits are a huge part of this budget. Are there any things, any places that aren't going to impact those students that we could just shave off some X amount of dollars that you might already have a feel for because you've lived and breathed this budget? I would throw the question out that way. And I would also say that if we're asking for a 1% from the uh, municipal budget, I want to see that documented and I want to see the impacts of it. Because what you just articulated, I, I heard, but I didn't absorb. And I think before we make a decision of a 1% decrease to the municipal budget, I want to see what the impacts are going to be. Because we did pretty tight on that budget. Well, my feeling is that um, we are adults. We can handle bad news. If if we have to make a cut, we're going to make the cut, and we're going to have it be have the least impact on children. Exactly. You may not like the cuts we come up with. You may not agree with them. We, we aren't going to be playing games either. Like we're, we're not going to cut out football. Right. Um, though it would be tempting. We're cutting um, out math. <laughs> right, but 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 I would ask that you then consider if we ultimately receive more funding from the state than we are expecting, that there be some permission to have that backfill our budget so we could put back in things that aren't in this budget right now. If you follow me, I mean, I would hope that there would be some yeah. give and take there. Yeah. Just one quick takeaway, just within this, uh, look, looking at all these calculations. My one big takeaway from looking at all these numbers is the school didn't have a spending issue. It's a revenue issue. Right, exactly. I mean, that's, I mean, you need to walk away from that, but as silver as the day is long. I mean, right. that's an $800,000 hole that you need to fill right. in one year. And, and maybe so you next year it will be, you know, not that at all. I mean, right. if the 3% thing goes through, it will be... So, so I think that's a good question. Could I just make a yeah. one more piece of this? Are those the kind of things that are going to be in the budget and not in the past? I have the referendum voting results for the past five years, and over those five years, Every single one of those years, the budget has been acceptable, except for one year, and that year was the year in which it was too low. So the voters who are voting for this school budget are supporting what it is that we're putting forward. And as Matt pointed out, we already shaved $800,000. That's a hit. And I'm not quite sure, other than not what else we could possibly do without impacting either the condition of our buildings or the I would like to uh, address Sarah's comment. The 3% the, the tax, the income tax uh, pr referendum on people with income over 200,000, that's in committee. And I don't, I don't think anyone uh, knows how that, if it, it does finally pass or they, however they appropriate it, that it's actually coming back to Cape Elizabeth. I mean, I don't know that that's a given. Um, you know, we are a low receiver in general because, you know, that's how the EPS formula works based on our income taxes, our property valuation, and so forth. And I'm not confident that the money that would be raised from that is, is going to, you know, necessarily flow into Cape Elizabeth. I'm not confident. I just, my point is the 10-year projection you have out to 2030 is a total guesstimate because it, could, it might impact. I mean, they're, they're predicting we're supposed to get between 1.5 and 2 million. I totally agree with you. The thing could, be, could implode in the court, but it might not. And so the point is if we're, if we're doing this 1% decrease because we're trying to be responsible for, 15 or, for you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, 
that is so uncertain that I think that's, I personally think that's a bad rationale to, at this late date, start cutting this much out of a carefully crafted budget that we've all agreed has nothing to do with adding or spending more. It's simply that this, the state hammered us this year. It, so, in other words, the future, the, the future projection is, it's interesting to take what's happened so far, but you know, human beings have a craving to, to look at the past and think that that's gonna predict the future. Economists try to do it, it never works. So, I guess what's the rationale for this now? Uh, Councilor Granin? Yeah, I would, <clears throat> for me, um, I think once I had this data, I think uh, last year was the first time uh, Mike McGovern put together kind of a holistic view of, of the years. And I think what our, our desire to have um, great, vibrant schools, um, which, you know, kind of buoy property values and everything else, you want to do that. But it was the first time for me that I looked at these numbers and thought, you could forecast that it has since, two, you know, 2001, the budget has, we've nearly doubled in 17 years. And I think if you project forward based on data, we're gonna double it again in a short period of time because of what, we're on that path. So I, I think with you know, all due respect to this process, that this is, is a prudent, smart thing. And certainly, if things change down the road, we can start funding differently. Mm -hmm. But I do think in order to, when you're looking at your, you're having unsustainable numbers that are crawling up out of this, you know, without, more people to fund them, you know, same amount of houses, that at some point, the, the people that are really going to suffer are the low income wagers, the seniors, and the middle, you know, they're going to have trouble paying for this, and we're going to have trouble sustaining. So I think we're just trying to look at creating, creating the best school we can have in a sustainable way, and, and that's kind of my view on it. Um, and I didn't feel that way. I used to be the person who is, you know, I, I always wanted to fund everything. Um, this might be the first time where I might be agreeing with this conversation. So my question is, we're now half an hour past our deadline. <laughs> Clearly we have disagreement. Should we, Well, I mean, what should we meet again tomorrow night? Should we decide at our workshop? Should we take a vote right now? I we, mean, how do we proceed? Well, we don't, we don't vote. We, we take a consensus. Um, if we're, in my understanding, if you correct me if I'm wrong, that if we, if we have a consensus to ask both the town manager and the superintendent to prepare, you know, numbers for a 1% decrease in what's been originally proposed. We can do that tonight. But I'm not sure everyone's had a chance to address that. And I, I think we could fairly quickly. So I don't. You know, we could, we could get a consensus, but has everyone weighed in? I mean. You weighed in already? Okay. Um, Mike. Mike. Concern with the proposal is that it, um, and I felt the same way last year when we sort of came out the same thing, is that it feels very um, arbitrary to me. Um, and so I, I, I look at the budget from a needs-based perspective and a, and a bottom-up perspective, and this feels like a top-down um, sort of backing into like I said, what I feel is a somewhat arbitrary number. And, and I'm all for the fairness, and I understand the, um, the desire for, you know, an equitable um, skin in the game kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. But if, and, and not even using these numbers as, as the example, but if there was a greater need for something, then that's what I feel like we should be funding versus let's all just take a 1% haircut. Um, which, um, while the, the end outcome is well-intentioned, I think, in terms of, you know, we talked last year about slowing the train down, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that, you know, Matt hit it really squarely on the head. In neither case are we talking about frivolent and... Uh, you know, over the top spending increases, we're all looking at a massive revenue problem, okay? okay? So when that happens, people can decide, well, you know, we, we have no other source of revenue in this town other than, you know, largely people's property taxes, right? That's the single biggest it revenue is. source for it us. Is. Um, as Joe points out, 
you know, this year more than probably any other, people will have the opportunity to vote how much does this, you know, matter to them? How much are they willing to put their skin in the game? Um, and I think, you know, people that maybe traditionally have sat on the sidelines and not come out for the referendum vote uh, for the school budget, you know, if, if they feel like they, they need to make sure that they do, then to, to make sure that their voice is heard, then so be it. But um, they're afforded that opportunity um, through the referendum process. And I, I'm just uncomfortable with the idea of sort of arbitrarily saying 1% across the board versus, um, you know, hey, here's, here's where we think that we've overreached on need and actually feel like we can pull back. I, I, you know, I, I think on both sides of the budget, I, I, there is not a lot that's packed into this that is, um, you know, in spite of what Matt has laid out in terms of being, you know, potentially easily achievable on a, you know, relatively small gap there if, if we were to do this. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that there's a lot of fat to be trimmed and, and, and I look at this from a needs-based perspective and, and to be quite honest on the school side, from what I've heard tonight and the research we've done to this point, you know, I think it's I think it's underfunded to be quite frank. Um, yes. You know, I think that you've done an admirable job with with trying to to keep things as low as possible. But from where I sit, I have I have deep deep concerns about the long range impact of um, underfunding. Uh, you know, the maintenance and operating expenses. Um, it, it, to me, there's, there's a, a very clear and short line that can be drawn between um, prospective uh, people moving to the community, coming and, and looking at our facilities, and that, that decline in student population. Um, you know, I, I will offer this as nothing more than anecdotal evidence, but I did talk to about three or four real estate agents in town who you know, without any particular, you know, vested interest in this process, when I asked them, said, more and more, I show families houses in town and we're losing people to other competing communities. All the, all the ones we've looked at on the list here, you know. Um, and, you know, they come into the schools and they see, hey, you know, it's, it's not as top notch as, you know, some of the other things I'm comparing against. And to me, those are all related things, and um, so I understand the need to to control the budgets, but um, we're you know we're doing everything we can on the expense <laughs> side. Unfortunately, we've got a, a big revenue problem. <coughs> Kathy. Um, okay, so I don't know if one percent is the number. Um, the council will decide, but as I've said already. We have declining enrollment. It's been declining for a while. One of the reasons the state doesn't send us as much money is because part of what they send us and the um, essential programs and services, a big piece of that is how many students do you have? So as they send us less money, they do that par partially because we have less students. Um, the staffing is going up. From what I gather, the um, special ed student population is lower than most other communities. 10%, um, I think, is what I heard uh, Jessica say. And it seems to be somewhat stable. Now, understanding that a special ed student might have every, you know, a need from outside placement to some additional help with some schooling, this is the 14th year I've done this budget. And um, I don't, you know, we talked last year about it not being sustainable. I think we need to take a serious look at salaries and benefits. They continue to creep up. How do we control that? Um, now, there'll be discussions about um, teacher negotiations and so forth. And I've heard in the past, I didn't hear it tonight, but I've heard in the past, well, we can't control that. It's all done by contract. You can control it. Um, the amount they're paid 
is determined by contract, but the number of employees you have is not. Um, I think that this budget can be trimmed. I say that because of my 14 years experience. Um, if we gave all the money that the schools would like to have, do I think that they would use it well? Absolutely, I do. Um, but I can't stop looking at the declining enrollment, the increase in budget. I mean, in the, since 2001, the school budget alone has increased over $11 million. That's a lot of money. And when I look at a taxpayer, and I have, who said, I can't afford my taxes. Now, it might be a single mom with a couple kids, that put braces on the kids' teeth, and now they can't. So, you know, I try to look at the big picture. Um, I am not always um, considered the popular opinion, but that's all right, um, because I think we have a responsibility, and I'm not saying we're not being responsible. As I said, give the schools three more million dollars. They'd use it wisely, but, you know, we have to think about um, everybody, all the taxpayers, all the people, most of our, rev most of our money for the schools and the town come from taxes. We're not Falmouth. We don't have all kinds of commercial stuff. We're not Yarmouth. We don't have a power plant. Um, um, uh, our teachers are paid fairly well. Um, I have a copy of the magazine that just came out this month from the MEA. And for, the, for Cumberland County, um, our teachers are paid above average in all six of the categories. So I, as it stands now, I will not support this. Um, what the council wants to do, I'm always, you know, will go along with the will of the council. But I think we should look at asking for a reduction in both school and town. I'm always very direct. You guys know that. So um, uh, that's enough. So how well, Owen, I, I, <coughs> well, but I, with, with the town manager's uh, my, my thought is that we could have, we, one, two, three, one, what? two, three, one. My, what? Maybe we could just have a straw. I think Penny's yeah. the what? what? do you, what, do you want to ask for a reduction or no. Excuse no. me. Okay. Okay, so we have three, Jessica. no, three, So what, yes. what I would, Sarah, I'm, what? I'm running the meeting, I'll, I'll ask the question, if you don't mind. <laughs> so I think the question would be, do we have a, what is a consensus on uh, asking the town manager and the superintendent to decrease their budgets? Who is in favor of asking the town manager to increase, decrease, I'm sorry, decrease their budget each by 1%? Do we, who's in favor of that? I am. What's the question? I'm sorry. Are you in favor, what, are you in favor of asking the town manager and the superintendent to decrease their proposed budgets by one percent. I think I I'm not opposed to asking for a decrease. I'm I'm with Jamie. It's an arbitrary number. I think we are all adults here, and we could say we need to look at pulling the reins in. And I don't know if it's one percent or 0.5 percent or 0.75 percent. The well, question on the table right now. Well, and we can have that conversation later. The question right now is, do you want to ask to reduce it by one percent? Well, let me just throw something else in there, because, you know, Jamie's brought that same concern up. We are, you know, we're not allowed to say to the school department, gee, we think you should cut X. We can certainly ask questions that we ha as we have. We can point out things as we have, but we can't say to them, you know, you, we think you should cut X, although we ask questions. So, so even though a number is arbitrary, it seems arbitrary, I mean, we can't specifically target things per se and say to them, you cut this and then come back to us. So that's, you know, anyway. So. Do you want to cut one percent? That's, I, I don't think that's what Penny was saying. She oh. was saying, just as an adult, ask them to go back and look at their budget and see if there's anything else oh. that they think they can trim the fat on. If they can't, they can't. If they can, they can. If they come up with 50,000, 100,000, 300,000, fabulous. That was what 
right? That's what we were. That's kind of what I was alluding to. That was what to. she was asking. But I'm not in favor of that either. I'm just saying. Okay. okay. I mean, the other, the other thing with this too, I mean, as Matt's just asserted, we, you know, we've potentially got the savings on the towns. I, I, if, if we vote this down, it's not like I don't want us to go save that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, bottom line, you're, you're still going to yeah, I mean, make so the adjustments on that, the That's part of why I'm uncomfortable with sort of, like I said, the, I want the, to the, 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 the almost randomness of the, of the, of the threshold. Um, okay. So, so do you, do, is there a consensus on a different number? Uh, I don't know. What, I mean, I guess point. my concern with this, mm -hmm. it's the same thing I expressed last year, that it, it makes the lengthy and, and deliberative and careful and responsible process null and void. It's basically saying, thank you for doing eight months of work, but now do it again faster. And so why did we spend days and hours of our time pouring over this to say we either approve it or not if you're now going to say like, oh, just go figure out what you can cut. Because I feel like if we're being responsible, we have to then look at that and say, this feels okay. Like Jamie's like, okay, if you start cutting more building maintenance, I'm not going to be okay with it. What is the time frame where we would again pour over a new budget, decide if it's okay with us and approve it or not approve it? I mean, in other words, I'm just baffled that we can say, I mean, we, we spent many workshops on our municipal budget. Why can we just say to Matt, like, go do another one and what, we'll quickly look at it? Like, to me, it just doesn't make sense to bring this up at this point in the budget. It's just what happened last year. If you're going to have a target number, you have to do it before people start the budget. So I'm uncomfortable just we saying, well, we cut, cut what you can, like, cut what you can and bring it back to us. Like, when are we going to look at that? So well, maybe I won't be okay with the cuts they're making. And by the way, yeah. we're not even allowed to weigh in on it. Right. So, I, so the whole thing seems to me bizarre. Uh, so we, we did discuss a target. I mean, we had we had back in it was either January or February. Right. I can't remember which it was. I mean, we had a, a our very first informal budget discussion was looking at you know what what things were tracking like, and mm -hmm. you know we had some guidance that we informally discussed in that <coughs> meeting. All of us were there. Um, I think in spite of that, my, my trouble though is that in spite of that, mm -hmm. the reality is that we did every, you know, I heard, I heard John talk about how at, at their most recent budget meeting, um, you know, how if, if this was a year with not even the full 800,000, but even an average, I think, of what had been um, received over, I forget what time period you're talking about, that this would have been a revenue neutral budget for you guys. Uh, decrease. Decrease even, right? Mm -hmm. So all of this, all of the spending that we've, you know, accounted for in the budget, I think tracked very well to the goal that we had. The reality is, is like I said, there's a revenue problem. So, you know, so there's two ways, obviously, you can look at that. You can say, okay, well, here's the amount of money we have to spend. So go figure out how to build the budget based on what you have to spend. The other way is to ask people, is this something you want to spend more for? And if you're willing to do so, then, you know, vote that way. And that's really the only two ways this breaks down. We're not going to, there's no revenue that's going to come out of thin air, right. you know, short of maybe getting a little bit of a windfall more than what we're expecting on the school side from Augusta or, you know, some incremental savings that we see. You know, so it's, it's basically saying either this is how much revenue we have, build your budget to the amount of revenue that we have, or if, if this stuff is important to people and they feel like they want to fund it, go out and vote for it. it it's a simple choice to make. As a, if, if, this, if this helps the council yeah. at all uh, with the changes that I that I have, at least uh, right now, no changes whatsoever. You're looking at four percent total change in the tax rate. Okay, that's if nothing changes on the school side, nothing changes on the town side. You know, as if this meeting never happened. Okay, and then if you implement this, the changes that I have, you know, that have, that I can put in there, we're looking at roughly 3.87% increase on the tax rate. So you're under 4% even if, well, you, just, if just, you implement those savings yeah, and those just, changes. Oh, with only a municipal reduction. That would be on the municipal not, side. Not so. asking the school department to reduce. So that would be with the re revised numbers that would take place as far as salary and benefits 
as well as changes, you know, subtle changes in revenue, putting those okay. those into into position. And what was our overall increase last year? Oh gosh. I mean, looking at the trajectory of the citizen vote, they tend to accept things in that range, right? It's sort of been around Under that four. range yeah. for six or seven years now, and it's never, as Joe points out, it's never been. It's always won by a, a, a super majority. I think last year was seventy-two percent. So it's. I don't have the sense that the citizens are as but it's discontent as perhaps the council is. I, if they're voting with their feet. I mean, if they're voting I think with everybody wants great schools. But I think that these things are compounding now. Yeah. And they're but, getting bigger and bigger. Oh, and I think that's all. Just right. the, maybe the dialogue right. and the awareness. What was it? Well, well, two years in a row, the state's cut. Jamie, what was yeah. the. Well, they've cut no, no. four, and then it went way up before that. I mean, I don't think. Wait, so it's two years in a row. They've cut a lot. So these guys haven't added to their budget in two years. It's been strictly the. With, the, the I like the idea of um, perhaps even just you know putting the school number out to the voters. I like the fact that we can pull it under four. It was 3.9. Yeah. It was 3.9 last year. Last year was the yeah. total was like 3.9. Total it's change. Technologically. What was it, Jessica? What was so you're actually it? coming in at 3.9. You'd get, you'd be like 21 thousandths of a, <laughs> of a count, count of a percent less, but you would still be yeah. you know, you'd be tracking basically you'd be tracking the same number. From one year to the next, I mean, increase. I think this has been a very, very good and robust discussion because the, these increases, I mean, they're just going up and up and up. And you know, you you have to ask the question: How much is enough? I right. mean, and there are a lot of people on fixed income. We have, we don't know what's happening with the three percent, although that's income tax rate is going to hit people, mm -hmm. and we're due for revaluation town wide. So I think that you know paying a lot closer attention to what what it means when we we both have budget increases and looking at the history is is critical. And I, I disagree with you, Sarah, that you know the projection the projections are important to look at and you 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 base them on what your history has been. I'm just saying they're not always accurate. No, but you know, looking at the trend without any additional borrowing, that's it. I mean that's what it is. And so, you know, you can't, you can't ignore that. And uh, I, I also think that um, it's important for all of us, and we do when I say this every year, is that we are representing everybody, not just, not just school parents and school children, but everybody. You know, we have to remember that. I so think is there consensus then that, that we are going to uh, support the municipal reduction and support the school's proposal and leave, leave that as is. Is that the consensus? I think so. That's is for me. Not okay. for me. Good okay. coming. And that's what your consensus is? I like and, the and, voters choose. Okay, yeah. so Patty and Sarah and um, Penny, where are you on that? I would ask that, and I'm assuming you're going to do this anyways, that uh, if, if we move forward with that budget, that where you can eke out those savings to over the year, you will make savings, create savings. Um, because I really think that, um, I mean, I, I do agree with Kathy that at a certain point it, it becomes untenable, the, the rate of increase. And I think you guys feel that and that's why this budget was so, I think, thorough. And so I will support putting it to the, uh, I'll support that. <coughs> I'll support the budget, support the reduction, but I, I just hope that we can't just keep up this trajectory. We can't. We say that every year, but do we do anything about what? it? What? We say that every year, but do we do I anything know. about it? I mean, Patty said last year, this is not sustainable. But here we are, sustaining it. But here we are. And I just, I'm making that point. Um, you know, if 1% is not the number that the council's comfortable with, then, you know, maybe there's another proposal that we ask that it be reduced and come back. Well, that's what, that's what I put out there, is to ask right. for a reduction. When I look at it, it's that the number is, when you say put 1% against the school budget, that number is big. 
Uh, and so you it's, go the difference. It's three. Uh, yeah, it's the three hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars out of. Uh, it, well, it's it's still an increase. Grand. It's what? It's about two hundred twenty thousand. Two hundred twenty thousand. Exactly. That's of a, a lot of money of to a, go find in a budget that you've already. That's true. But out of you've 20, scrutinized twenty-four point nine million. So that's where it's coming out. Okay. Okay. Was a quick comment. I think what Kathy's saying and, and how I hear is it's a bigger issue for the school board than just cutting a few hundred thousand dollars. If you really want to start seeing the budget drastically cut, then they're going to have to start having policy changes. You keep referencing student class sizes. So two years in a row you, you've referenced that. That's right. And so that's, so that's what the school board's got to put out there to the citizens. Be like, you want us to jack up the class sizes, 25 kids in a classroom, 27 kids in a classroom? We can drop that budget right down like that. But I bet you you won't get support of that. You're, you're misinterpreting my comment. But I'm just saying, Don't overall, the way to reduce that yeah. budget it's a bigger, is drastic it's a bigger policy budget. changes to the way the school systems run. That is how I would envision you having to start curving. But I'm not sure the town of Cape Elizabeth and the citizens street wants drastic changes to their fabulous school system, is Kate, my opinion. Caitlin, you don't speak for me, and that's I'm not, not I'm, I'm just saying how I hear, how I hear what you're saying is, I'm just letting you know how other people might hear what you're saying. Now, what I'm saying is, is the policy that they had a year and a half ago was sufficient at the time. When they changed the policy, they reduced class size. Um, now, maybe that's what's acceptable. Um, my experience is that when parents look at class size, they want their child in the lowest class size possible. I get that. I'm a parent. Um, I get that. But, but you have to weigh that against taxpayers and what taxpayers are paying and the people that are working hard for their tax dollars. And, you know, how does that wash out? If I'm a parent, I want my kid in the 14 student class. Mm -hmm. But is it okay for them to be in a 16 or 18 student class? Maybe. It was a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So why is it not now? Can we adjourn? I gotta go to bed and have another. Yeah, yeah I, I think we gotta. I like dying. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so it looks like we have consensus, majority consensus in the council to, to reduce the municipal budget as, as Matt has proposed, to leave the school budget as it is. Does everyone feel that we're done and we need to meet again tomorrow night or we're, this is sufficient? Sufficient. Okay. I think you're all for your support. We do appreciate it. And I, I, I know this is not easy. I, I appreciate it very much. Well, I thank everyone's work and hard work. And of course, you know, this is always difficult. Yeah. And, uh, but everybody has been respectful and cordial and has worked very hard and um, you know as you know we we have we have taxpayers that we answer to um, as well as everything else and i appreciate all your efforts tonight and uh, your thoughtful responses thank you very much for thank you. Thank you. and thank you to the council thank you. Thank you. Okay. we're adjourned <laughs>